Well, the thing is, is like, T.I. doesn't intimidate me now. T.I., it's almost so famous that he almost doesn't feel real. This is a, this is a funny story. So I got to go to his uh, birthday party and uh, and it was ended up being a fucking crazy night. And then uh, the next morning, he came to one of our rehearsals because he would just drop by sometimes because I was in the neighborhood or whatever he would say. Yeah. And like he came up and uh, he's like, "Hey, how's it going?" And I was like, "Dude, thanks so much for inviting me, man. That that party was like, it was crazy. It was like some kind of a weird dream." And then he just looks at me and he's like, "Yo, ass, better wake the fuck up." And I and I was just like, "Ooh," uh, <laughs> I kind of couldn't even be mad because I was like, "That was a good one." Hey, everybody! I don't know why I did that. Welcome to episode 21 of the Andrew Deitch Podcast. It's the one month anniversary of the Andrew Deitch Podcast, and I just released the weekly update today, so I'm not going to ramble here. If you want to hear me ramble and talk about all that sappy stuff, then go listen to the weekly update, because I talked all about all the stuff that's going on with the podcast. But today... On this episode, I'm not gonna bore you with all that. We're gonna talk about my fam, my 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 friend, Will Foskey. Will Foskey is hilarious. He's a super talented comedian, and Will has been doing stand up for a few years now. Um, he has directly worked with a ton of really talented people, including DC Young Fly, who's on MTV's Wild and Out, Emmanuel and Philip Hudson. Um, And many more hilarious comics. Um, And combined, those three dudes I just mentioned have about 7 million followers on Instagram. So obviously, Will is doing something right if he's hanging out with those dudes. Um, Will and I have a few mutual friends, and he had listened to the podcast. And he reached out to me asking if he would consider me um, to have him as a guest. And to be completely honest, at first I was a little bit hesitant to do it since I had never met this guy before. And I was like, maybe he might be like a serial killer or something. But, you know, I I stalked him a little bit. I looked him up on YouTube and I thought, okay, I'll give this guy a chance. If he's funny, I'll have him on the podcast. And I found a clip of him on YouTube from one of his stand-up comedy shows. Um, And mainly I was just like, okay, if this guy sucks... I'm not going to have him on. If he's funny, I'll have him on. And so obviously he didn't suck. I was cracking up the whole time. Like seriously, it was just a five minute little clip from YouTube and I was laughing out loud. It was great. So I messaged him back and I told him I was totally down. But um, on this episode, Will and I talked about his upbringing and how it shaped him into being a comic, um, his intro into the world of comedy and the, you know, the racial segregation that still exists in the comedy world. Some stories of him totally bombing on stage, going on tour, performing in front of thousands of people, literally, and his stories of hanging out with the T.I. T.I., everybody. (laughs) Will's got some awesome stories, and needless to say, this is one of the funniest podcasts I've done so far. Um, I was cracking up the whole time, and and re-listening to this podcast, I was cracking up too. It was super fun getting to know Will and hang out with him for a couple hours. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. So enough talking. Here is my new friend, Will Foskey. All right, Will Foskey, we're live, sir. What's up? Live and direct. How's it going? (laughs) It's good, man. Dude, this um, this is actually a really cool podcast because, like, I haven't really done a podcast where I don't really know somebody that well yet. Yeah. A lot of people have been my, you know, my friends or, like, whatever. So, it's kind of cool. Like you said, you you knew uh, Connor Peterson. Yep. And we're just like, dude, I Old love to be on your podcast. Yeah, the funny thing was is I was like, okay, this guy wants to be on the podcast. Let's, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a comedian. And I'm like... Okay, cool. Like, I'm just gonna Google him and see if, <laughs> yeah. he, if it's if his comedy sucks or not. Uh-huh. And you were really funny, man. I I actually Thanks. enjoyed it. It was funny. <laughs> I watched like a little clip, and uh, yeah, man, I was I was sold. I was like, okay, this guy's cool. I, oh, thanks, man. I, <laughs> I appreciate it. I've, yeah, comedy's just always been something I've wanted to do, and uh, you know, hopefully, I'll get to put on for Woodstock one day. That's awesome, man. I'll be the hometown hero, even though probably everyone in that town hates my guts. <laughs> <laughs> All the adults, at least. <laughs> That's hilarious. I feel like 
being you know growing up and you and even wanting to be a comedian you've got to always just be kind of the class clown kind of guy or whatever yeah yeah and like, just getting in trouble or whatever well because all the time i would just like be funny because like i didn't want people to hate me like, yeah because i wouldn't i would have never have admitted it then like it's so funny to look back on how you act like as a kid where like Oh, I'll get to that later. But basically, like, I was always weird. Like, I was never that good at sports. That's usually that's usually number one for comedians. Definitely. Uh, number two, the sport I did play was hockey, so no one gave a shit. Mm. And then, as you can see, I've got my Thrasher's shrine I over see. there. Very nice. R- R.I.P. Uh, yeah, I was about to say that. R.I.P. <laughs> Thrasher's. It was, uh, like, it got, that being a fan of the Thrasher's, I just started having to, like, make up reasons to, like, be a fan of them. <laughs> Although I did find out one thing that was cool. They have they had the most black players on their team of any NHL team at one time. You really? know how many they how many had? Day? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, was it like two? <laughs> that's but yeah, hilarious. But And I was like, well, that seems like appropriate, you know, for Atlanta or whatever. But anyways, <laughs> I, uh, I, always, I always wanted to do comedy. Um, I never knew I could. But then one thing that was really like a breakthrough was, did you watch Chappelle's show as a kid? Mm -hmm. A little bit. My parents are kind of like pretty Christian and like very, uh, they were very controlling of what I watched. So I didn't get to watch very much of it, but I've seen it and I I appreciate it now. Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's famous for all like the sketches and stuff. But what I always liked is when Dave would just come out and just like talk to the crowd. Yeah. And I always kind of remember thinking like, he's at work right now. Like that's, that's what he does. And I was just thinking to myself, like, if I can just figure out a way to where I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then just school and growing up Catholic and shit, it just, like, beat the optimism out of me. (laughs) Until finally, my friends dared me to go do it, and I did it. And it went really well. That's so awesome. Yeah, this chair is really squeaky. It's okay. Yeah, Yeah. if you hear some squeakage, you're just going to have to deal with it. (laughs) We don't have any (laughs) WD-40. But, um... Like I said, I kind of start off my podcast typically with like the whole childhood kind of like growing up. And you already kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, you grew up kind of Catholic and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So just like walk me through what what was baby Will Foskey <laughs> and how did he grow up to be this? Well, it was baby this, William at the time. Uh, uh, I see. Yeah. It was baby a, William. It was a blustery cold day up in Clarksville, Georgia. <laughs> And uh, and my and my mom gave birth to me on the Monday morning of March thirteenth, nineteen hundred and ninety five. And uh, when th- we lived on it, my parents they had a farmhouse at the time, but it was like literally like this four room like kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, living room, or whatever. And it had a lot of land. And I don't know how or why they were there, but they were just renting it. And so the coolest thing is this: what my mom always tells me. I don't know if this is significant or not, but a podcast is probably the place to say it. Uh, when I, I grew up around a bunch of cows, like they, there were always cows on the farm. And when they came, when my mom came home holding me, like in my little like baby bundle, like all the, all the, uh, cows came up to look. So huh. it was, it was like the lion king, you know? <laughs> so I'm, Did I'm, she hold you up like Simba? No, I she don't like think so. She climbed up on the she, fence and like. <laughs> she was probably really tired from the epidural and was dizzy and was probably scared she would like drop me yeah. and I'd get eaten. That's but, hilarious. Um, yeah, so I lived there for two years. Then we moved. Uh, we moved to Roswell when I was young, and I lived there until I was about eight. And uh, and in between that time, I actually lived on an island uh, over two different summers. It was Osaba Island off the coast of Savannah, Georgia. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, my mom. Uh, she was a writer, or she still is, but she was back then. And uh, she like lied to my school and told them that I was being homeschooled because she thought like being on this like. And it was very unpopulated. So she thought that like me being there would be like more important than, you know, learning fucking fractions or whatever. She's like, you can figure <laughs> that shit out later. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah. It was it was So your mom was kind of a rebel in that way? Mm-hmm. Probably why I felt like enabled to do comedy in the first hmm. place. That's interesting. Because my dad was more like he's he's super cool, he's real supportive and stuff, but he's very kind of just serious. Hmm, I feel you. And uh most I feel like, like most mm, of our dads are. <laughs> yeah. I've got to provide for this family. No time for goofing off. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta program shit so my wife and kid can go on this fucking island and <laughs> feed peacocks and shit. So it was just you and your mom that went to the island, or he would and your come, dad stayed back. Yeah, he would come and visit, but I mean, he had to stay because we couldn't, we couldn't leave the house alone. And um, but the island was really, really cool. Um, How did you wait? So what was this? It was like a program that. You were allowed to go to this island or you just decided your mom was just like 
We're just going to this island and we're going to figure it out. Well, I, my parents, when I was young, I went to a Montessori school, which is just the biggest bullshit of an institution of all time. Really? And it's kind of like, it's like if preschool could just go on forever. Because they're, they're like, well, what work would you like to do today? And they'll tell that to kids. And you're like, I want to I wanna f- poop. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. No. And kids are like, well, I don't want to fucking do any of that. And they're like, well, good. What a good way to express yourself. Huh. And then and it, it's, yeah. And so my mom told him and was basically like, yeah, we're, we're homeschooling him. We're, we're going to just do that for a little while. When in reality, I spent like six months on this island helping her like with like farm chores and shit. Because when we were there, we had to, we got to stay there for free because my mom was writing a book about it. But then in exchange for that, we would have to go and get all the groceries and shit and, okay, and that look after sense. the animals and stuff. So she was writing a book about like living on that island or whatever, and Just, the owners of it were... Well, the history of it. It was, it was really interesting, actually. The, the lady who lived there, she just now left the island, but she was in her late 80s when I was young, so she's 103 now. Holy shit. I know. She, um, so the story is, is she was like, she lived in Detroit when she was a little girl. And her parents were like wealthy motor tycoons, like before like monopolies were even a thing. And then like their their estate burned down, or monopolies were a thing. They fucking had one. Yeah, but, but they uh, weren't like outlawed. Yeah, they and just had a monopoly, and no one could say anything or whatever. Yeah, and so and so uh, their estate burned down, and they were like, ah, it's okay. We'll just go buy an island. It's 1917. We can go and do this. And they purchased an island. And they built this big like mansion on it with like these old like Spanish tiles and shit. And uh, the lady lived there for the rest of her life. And so I got to like see that, and I thought it was really really cool. That is really cool. When Did I, you live in that mm-hmm. in that mansion thing? Oh, I got to stay in the big house. That's sweet. Yeah, it was cool. Big house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's actually really awesome. Yeah, it was uh, it was cool. Um, There's some weird stuff when you deal with like old money like that, where it's just like so much money that. Well, there were buttons in the rooms, and I was like, "Well, what are these for?" And my mom was like, "They're doorbells." And I was like, hmm. "And then I came back later, and I was like, what was that for?'" And they were like, "That was so the help could come." And I was like, "Ooh, that's I forgot about that." Yeah. And so when it's I went, it's creepy when there's people working in your house. They were slaves, yeah, yeah, essentially, because yeah. they were like, "Well, this is an island. This ain't America. Then we can run it how we oh, want to run it." Oh shit! And uh, but that's that in the, actually makes a lot of sense. And this was in the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so, but I'm, but at the time, it's so fucked up because I, I was I didn't care. I was like, "Ah, there's alligators in the beach and shit." But then I went, I went back, I went back when I was older, and I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. this is creepy, kind yeah, of." Yeah, like yeah, and and like I was like a selfish white guy about it. Like I was like, "Well, now I don't get to enjoy this." But that's not like the biggest <laughs> problem. The biggest problem is that that happened. But like I made it about myself. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, until I really like could process it or whatever. And, uh, That's so funny. One thing, though, that I, I thought was hilarious is you've seen the movie The Blind Side, right? Yes. I always felt like something was a little off with that movie. Like, because it's it, they kind of made it to where it seemed like Sandra Bullock was, was like, well, thank God for Sandra Bullock or that kid would have had no chance. Mm. When he was like the most talented like football player ever. Yeah. And and they made him look like an idiot, too. Like, Michael Orr hates that movie. Yeah. But, but anyway, I just never quite sat right with me. And then I swear to God, they had uh, they had like plantation huts, which I guess technically they weren't slaves anymore, but like they they were. Yeah, it's like when you're paying someone so little and they're living there, and you're paying them with room and board, kind of. It's almost it's not slavery, but slavery in the way that they don't really have another option to leave, really. Well, it's that kind of creepy thing that you see in the South sometimes where it's like, oh, it ain't slavery. It's just, you know, his daddy worked for my daddy and my da- his great granddaddy and my daddy. And then mm. you're like, yeah, but if you go back far enough, though. <laughs> and, uh, so true. But it, but it is what it is. And it's horrible. But at the same time, it, it is what it is. And so I looked at it. And what I always thought was very weird is the plantation house was in shambles. Like it was destroyed. But the huts were in really good shape. And I was kind of like, well, why? I wonder why. 
And then I look and I swear to God, there's a plaque that says, and, and if you're listening, fuck you, you stupid bitch. There was, a, there was a plaque that said, these huts were paid for and restored by the Sandra Bullock Foundation. And I was like, that motherfucker. I knew that's why she made the blind side. She fucking felt bad about buying the slave huts and was like, I got to do something to clear my conscience. Are you serious? Yeah, and the years lined up too. It was like 2007 or something, I think. <laughs> And I just remembered thinking, like, you sneaky motherfucker. So to this day, I know of two things that Sandra Bullock owns. Uh, a liquor store in Sandy Springs and slave huts. That's right. That's right, America. Your, your, your sweetheart is not who you think she is. Wow. <laughs> That's Can, right. I'm calling out sound, wow. Sandra Bullock. color me surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Ta nation, Miss Bullock. <laughs> Miss Bullock, how could you? That's hilarious. <laughs> You're giving it, me the vapors. This is totally uh, un not super unrelated, but... Yeah, let's get off of Bachelor Sandra yeah, Bullock. But, she sucks, but... one but... thing that I was going to say was I spent some time living with a family in um, Italy a couple uh, summers ago, uh -huh. and a similar kind of thing was the case because they lived in this old... Not plantation, because that's not what it's called there, but you know right. what I mean, like a kind of villa. That's what it was. Oh, villa. that's never good. Yep. <laughs> and the, the third floor was the slave quarters, and the crazy thing was uh -huh. is like they had like a big shower room area and like... <laughs> it was really weird and and the the grossest thing to me was they still had a butler made people that worked in the house when I lived there mm -hmm. and since but I worked for the family I was actually an au pair so I was like the nanny oh, like that's I took really care cool. of their kids that's awesome but I didn't have to sleep upstairs I got to sleep in a nice room uh. and the other workers did they had to sleep up in the slave quarters, even though um, oh, I hate I don't to be this were... guy, man. But man, they must have hated your fucking guts. Oh, I'm sure they did. <laughs> they probably wouldn't have said anything. No, but... no, no, no. They hated me, and I, and it was awkward for me because I didn't choose that. Like, sure, no, of, of course. That was but... the thing is, I always tried to be super, super nice to them because the family was nice to them, but like, it wasn't like they treated them terribly and like they had a job because of them, all that. But like, you know. Yeah, they they probably t totally hated me. Yeah, but you know it's but that's pretty cool that you got to do that. So you like you'd be like, the there was literally a butler. They would change my plates <laughs> at the meal. Like first course would come. Giuseppe, you know, bring me more vino. He literally had <laughs> white gloves on and a butler uniform oh. and would change the plates behind my back. Oh, that's terrifying. It was weird, man. It's How just, are you to well, say the least? I just don't understand weird. how people are okay with that. Well, the, the, the way that, like, I kind of understood it was this guy was from Sri Lanka, right? Mm -hmm. And to him, it was a good opportunity. Right. Because if he was staying back home, he, was, he said that what he was doing with the money, because I, I kind of had a conversation with him one day. He didn't speak very good English, so it was kind of broken. But basically what he was telling me was all the money that he was making working there, he was sending back to his family in Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, I'm, th they can't make very much money there. I'm making way more money here than I could if I was back home. Yeah. But he was like, he would like Skype with his kids and stuff because he had like a laptop, which sure. was kind of cool. But one of his daughters, I think, was like 30 or something. And it's like, he can't, he hasn't even seen her in like 10 years or something crazy. And, and also an, another part of it, like you said, is he was probably really happy about it. And this might just be us being like privileged Americans, not knowing how the rest of the world is. And mm -hmm. we're like, once again, being like, well, this makes us feel bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And let's, that's the real tragedy, folks. Exactly. But in reality, no. <laughs> it's just like, well, this makes me uncomfortable because of what I learned in school. Exactly. Like, ooh, the white guilt thing. Yeah. Oh, it's but a thing. It, it totally is a thing, for sure. But, um, but yeah, that was the whole deal with my experience with that. So I kind of can relate on the, on a weird level. Cause yeah. It was the first time when I they were like, go upstairs. They have, yeah, all your clothes that they washed for you. Because the housekeeper would like wash all the clothes Ugh. and stuff. And I went, they were like, yeah, if you want. Because I was like, where's this shirt? Like, I kind of wanted to wear this shirt. And they're like, oh, it's hanging up upstairs. If you want to go up there, you can get it. So I go up to this third floor and I'm like, what the fuck? And then I realized that I was like, oh, shit. Like. This was the slave quarters, which is very And then weird. you're like, like, how could these people have all this money? And it's like, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Dolce and Gabbana. <laughs> That's, oh, I get it. Yep, and they owned a bunch of land. It was on a farm, so like they had a bunch of land and stuff. Like, I'm sure that they were... They, and, oh, the creepiest part, too, was later on, I, I lived there for a while, I looked through some of their photo albums, some of the really old ones, and it had pictures of slaves, like working in the fields and stuff. Oh, yeah. God. It was very, very creepy. Yeah. 
And like I couldn't do anything about it. I was just living there. Yeah, right? you were no pair. I didn't. Yeah. I, this might be like sexist or whatever. I didn't know they let men do that. Yeah, it is weird because um, I didn't know that either. And my friend was no an pair. And um, I've talked about this on the podcast before. But basically, mm-hmm. my friend, um, she was an au pair and I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like you get to live with a family and really like experience life like in a different country. I was like, I wish I could do that. And well, she's you like, get to experience the richest possible life. Exactly. Wherever you go, cause they can afford to have an au pair <laughs> yeah. flown in from yeah. the US. Yeah, but, um, but they were like, but she, I was like, yeah, that's so cool. I wish I could do that. And she's like, you could like, I've, I know guys that are au pairs. I'm like, really? That's weird. But um, the way that it makes sense is it, the, I've done it twice now and both families had only boys. Mm. So it was like they didn't want their boys to be hanging out with a girl all day, and like the boy, the little boys didn't want to be hanging out with the girl because like she wouldn't want to play soccer with them. She didn't want to like throw them around in the pool, you know, sure. just like doing like wrestling. Well, or, they could have you know, gotten just... an East German gal. She could have. She could have. <laughs> old, old Helga could have showed him who was boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like a Russian. <laughs> like some. Yeah, but. But anyways, that that was the whole deal there was basically it was just it's families with boys. So they they really they're like, yeah, we'd rather have a guy, even though it is weird. Yeah, I will admit it. It's very strange. That's badass. I want to use that as a vessel to do international comedy. I'll be like, yeah, I'll babysit the kids or whatever. And then I'll just leave and go do stand up (laughs) and be like, yeah, that's right. I performed in Italy. (laughs) <laughs> Even though it was just totally under some bullshit circumstances. Yeah, yeah, it was like you were like on a street corner. <laughs> That's uh, funny, man. I would just, if I went over there, I would just like, uh, I just make making fun of Americans is just funny to me. Whenever I meet people oh, from other great. countries, like it, I just got back from the lake with my family and my, my uncle li- is, lives in Hong Kong. He met his wife in Beijing. They moved there, and they got four kids now. Wow! And so when they when they came back, uh, or when they were up at the at the lake house, I was talking to him, and I was just kind of like, "What do you guys think of America? Like, what do you think of Americans?" They're like, "Well, we love your culture, but we think you guys are all idiots who have no idea what's going on." And I was <laughs> like, "Well, would you mind telling me what is going on? Because I don't think I know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know." That's perfect. And like my like thirteen year old cousin is explaining to me like the world economy, and I'm like, what real for real? <laughs> and, and she's like, how don't you know this? I was like, because I went to school here. Yeah. Like how the fuck? I, I didn't would, even learn fractions. Yeah, I didn't learn fractions. <laughs> I was given fucking hay to horses and feeding a peacock. I was peacock. feeding peacocks, and I never learned how that there was numbers less than. One. I was busy learning about how Sandra Bullock is not who she has presented herself to be to <laughs> what America. What do you know about that little 13-year-old <laughs> Japanese yeah. kid? And then they're like, "What? not that a movie, though? Like, isn't, aren't you guys involved in, like, a war? I was like, oh, yeah, 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 maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't even know. So, po- podcast listeners, if you're, if you're here looking for some serious insight to the state of the world, I'm not your guy. <laughs> That's but okay. I don't... If, if you want someone who can make fun of things, then yeah. There we That's go. That's my favorite thing to do is just making fun of stuff. I like that. It's the only way. And I don't, I wouldn't do it in like a mean way. Like if I saw like somebody, I wouldn't, I don't know how to explain it. There's a way to do it that's fun for everybody. I exactly. Think. I think that comedy is all kind of about that. Like finding the thing that no one really realizes is strange. And then once you point that out, they're like, oh Yeah. Yeah. I have thought about, you know, or whatever. Like, well, what's are you... the deal with this? What's the... <laughs> so, what's the deal with these? You know, have you ever noticed that, that when you open up the dryer, there's always one less sock? What happens to that sock? You that's, know, a, like... that's a classic 1980s stand-up observation. Yes, yes. <laughs> Observational <laughs> comedy. Um... That's hilarious. But let's get back to your story yeah. for a minute. So, so you grew up on this... Not grew up, but you spent some time on this, like, island. And, mm-hmm. then, and then kind of what happened? Well, I think that, and all of this, I'm kind of explaining, just gearing it towards how it like manifested into me doing comedy and stuff. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Uh, I was alone a lot because I'm an only child, and I was on an island, and my mm. mom would be working, and then I'm not gonna. What am I gonna talk to a 100 year old about? <laughs> Very true. Like, I, there. This is actually it's a joke I do in my act, but this is a true story. When I went back and uh, and I was 18, and she was 100, she uh, she tried to fuck me. Because she thought I was Jimmy Stewart. You know the guy from It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> no, what? Yeah. Yeah. She thought you were Jimmy Stewart? Uh-huh. Like, I'm like a tall, like, skinny guy or whatever. Is and she, I guess, like, really blind? Or? I mean, maybe. Or just really has dementia. 
And because she just, like, I guess she just knew, uh, she probably knew him. She was rich as hell. And they might have been at the World's Fair together or some shit. <laughs> the but, World's Fair, that's but, amazing. But they, but yeah, so what am I going to talk to her about? I'm like, well, so what was Calvin Coolidge like? Like, that's <laughs> not interesting to me. And there wasn't a TV or anything. So I would just kind of just like go around and like fuck with the animals and just <laughs> do whatever. That's funny. And But I just had a lot of time to be like alone with my thoughts. And so, mm. and so now it kind of helps like my writing process because some people, and even me sometimes, like when they're just by themselves, they're like, I need to fucking talk to somebody mm. or I'm going to lose my goddamn mind. Totally. But like if, but now like when I'm by myself, I'm just, I can just kind of be like, well, what happened today that kind of made me be like, sometimes what I'll try to do now when I write jokes is it's not so much of a thing of like, what's funny. It's more of like, what made me go, huh? Like what made me kind of be like, uh, what was, what was that? And then make a joke about that. Yeah. Because, like, it's hard to make a joke about something that's already inherently really funny. Exactly. And then sense. you have to deal with the concept of parallel lines of thinking where someone someone yeah, yeah. somewhere has already made that joke a hundred sure. times. Oh, yeah. And then, and then someone, you know, especially once you get more well-known and more people hear your act and stuff, they're like, I heard... I heard what's his name do that back in not in the nineties. You're stealing jokes or whatever. Oh yeah, it ha I mean, but that happens a lot. And the the thing is, is what we do in Atlanta. Like Atlanta is a pretty, I would say it's a it's a community for sure. Where it's kind of like we all more or less hold each other accountable to, uh, to joke stealing. You're saying? Yeah, and I mean, there's of course there's a fair share of shade throwing and pettiness and 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 drama, but that's everything that you do. Mm -hmm. But what like for instance. There was one time I, I had a joke that I thought I wrote. I used to open my act with it. I said, my RAV4 has a backup camera, which is nice because then I can actually aim at the homeless people. <laughs> and, and somebody told me, they were like, that's from an episode of Tosh.0. Oh. And my first instinct was just like, oh, like, thank you. Like, thank you for letting me know. I'll scrap it. I'll write something else. I don't need that. And that's what's scary is when sometimes if you tell somebody, like, because you kind of, it's hard to tell another person that like, hey, I'm not saying you're a thief, but I have heard that, you know? Yeah, and then, totally. And then, a, like you said, a good comedian will just scrap it. Yeah, you can write something else. It's no big deal. Exactly. And, I mean, of course, when you deal with things like dating or having kids or something, like, uh, that's where it would probably get a little bit more tricky. But, and, and of course, there's going to be some kind of lines of parallel thoughts. But for the most part, everybody does a pretty good job of, of, of keeping it real. And then when people don't, like if people consistently come and are just like ripping off Bill Burr or something like that, yeah, we'll notice and we'll just we, we won't put them on the shows anymore. That Co makes sense. Comedians so you kind of just are very them. passive aggressive. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And uh, and so, that, but for the most part, we do hold each other accountable for that. So That's really cool. If you got a good circle of other comics who know comedy and who you trust and trust you and stuff, there's there the amount of bullshit in that respect is very very minimal. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So, um... Oh, no, I thought I had it on airplane mode. Oh, oh so see, what just happened now, and I'm actually going to do this for you on the podcast, is there's a show in Atlanta called Star Bar, and it's like kind of like one of the like best shows in the city. And in order to get on the show, you have to call in like exactly at 5 p.m. Really? So I'm t right now, every other comedian anywhere, their it's alarm... calling? Yeah, their alarm just went off, too. So... This is this. I wouldn't normally do this, but this is actually kind of a part of uh, of the of thing. comedy. Yeah, we'll see if I get. No, through. that's actually cool. So wait, so you have to call in exactly at five to see if you can get a spot. Yeah. Ah, where is Star Bar? It's. Uh, you ever been to the Vortex in Little Five Points? Yes. With the big skull. Yes. Right across the street. Okay, cool. Yeah. I've actually. Is it? It's up above. It's not underneath. No, it's up top. It's up to oh okay. It's a it's a punk rock club, but they do comedy there on. That's Mondays. funny because in the basement of that area, there's a uh, sensory deprivation tank place. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's fucking yeah. Cool I've been shit. there a couple times. It's literally right underneath that. It's right across the street from the vortex. Watch this. All right, let's see. Please leave your message. Oh for fuck four, yeah. Zero, four, nine, three, four, <laughs> six, five, nine, eight. Hey Rodney, it's Fosky. Just seeing if I can get some time at the Star Bar on Monday. Thanks, man. <laughs> and you just witnessed comedy history, folks. Wow. That is how it's done. It was on this day. 
that Will Foskey got his big break at the Star Community Bar. <laughs> a big f executive from HBO happened to be there and offered him uh, offered him a stand-up special. Oh, that's another thing too, man. I'm nowhere. I'm I'm probably the thing is I should let you know I'm not like the fucking hot shot guy. I I would say I'm pretty okay at what I do for how long I've been doing it, but uh, you know it's. HBO, it's so crazy the way that things have changed is now I don't even know if that's what I want. Like hmm. I, I would rather build like a following through like YouTube or something like that. That's why I really like what, what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, it's- Would you ever want to do the road? I have done the road. I mean, I haven't done like the, the road. The road where you're like traveling all around. And, well, yeah. com comedians will do this thing a lot where they'll just go to like open mics somewhere else and be like, we're on tour. <laughs> <laughs> and uh sorry to blow the whistle on you other comedians but that's totally what's going on and uh <laughs> that's funny but no sometimes like and if you're listening to this and you follow me on facebook i totally fucking am on tour and i'll fucking fight you if you think otherwise <laughs> but uh <laughs> no i've done it a lot like if you look right over there see that shirt ratchet people meet stand-up tour that was nice. the first tour i ever went on dc young fly headlock Excuse me, didn't mean to burp on the podcast. Oh, it's okay. DC Young Fly headlined uh, my friend Erica Duchess, Marco Lavelle, Nav Green, and myself. That's awesome, dude. That's and, really cool. And what's cool about Fly is he's got millions of Instagram followers. And so even though he technically didn't start as a stand-up, I keep burping this damn Heineken. I'm so sorry to everybody listening to this. Um, but because he had such a huge Instagram following. And do you know Fly? Do you know anything about him? I've heard that name before. He's like in, he's he's an Instagram comedian kind of. Yeah, he does he's on Wild and Out. He does a, like okay. a bring that ass here, boy, like he roasts people. Gotcha. And um so I I got started with him. We can actually get into this. I'll I'll tell you how my career started and yeah, we can backtrack yeah, yeah. if you want. So Yeah, cuz it seems like we're just going back to comedy anyway. So let's just talk about that. Yeah. Cuz yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. main thing anyways. Well, yeah, but also I know how you how you roll, so I'll always try to relate it to personal growth and insight yeah, and, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that. So um, uh, when I was 18 years old, I went to Kennesaw State University. I have since dropped out. I respect anybody who still goes there, but I, it was one of those things where I was just like, from the first day I stepped into class, I was like, there's no fucking way. <laughs> There's just no fucking way. Exactly, I'm dude. sure I could just take all the Adderall in the world and just become a zombie and maybe get through this, but there, I'm too distracted. Like, there's too much. And so I remember that day, my girlfriend at the time, she told me that, uh, she was like, what do you really want to do? And I was like, I, like, I want to be a stand-up comedian. And, uh, and she was like, you could never do that. And I was just like... Well, you're, maybe you're right. Because sometimes a, a bad girlfriend can have a way of making you feel like you're worthless. Totally. And uh, and so I was walking around really upset like the, with like a little Winnie the Pooh, Pooh rain cloud over my head all day. <laughs> like Eeyore or some shit. And then uh, I went to go smoke a blunt because I was mad. Like I was like, don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> I, I went to go. I went to go. Because I was mad. <laughs> yeah, I was. And so I was like, I'm going to calm down and this is going to be fine. So I got now I'm walking through the the uh, the, the com wherever the gift shop is is the that's the, the commons right? I don't it's, fucking know. Yeah, it's Where right we, next to the commons. Yeah, yeah totally. the gift shop and the little Chick Fil A thing. Yeah, I yeah, was, it's like off to the side and then it opens up into that parking lot. Yeah. yeah. So I came in from the parking lot, walking through there, just reeking, being all reeking of pot and sadness and defeat, and I was like walking through, and all of a sudden I just hear, "Hey, white boy," and I went, "Huh." And it was Emmanuel Hudson, the guy from the Ratchet Girl song, or like the asking all them questions, like that. No way, the guy with the giant mouth. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Assume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That guy's hilarious. And so, um, how does he do that with his face? <laughs> I'll ask him next time I see him. I'll tell him. I'll. Tell He's him. funny. How did he know you? He didn't. He just said. He, I think their video just needed diversity. They needed a white guy. And I was like, <laughs> affirmative action strikes again. And uh, he's like, he's like, hey, white boy. And I went, huh? And I came in, and uh, and he goes, all right, uh, I really appreciate you coming in here. He's like, you're probably not going to get any lines. We're just doing, like, this little skit. And, like, the whole time I'm so high, I'm like, this guy looks just like Emmanuel Hudson. Like, I'm not putting the pieces together. Wait, so you were just walking through, and then all of a sudden he just stopped you? Pure coincidence. Pure luck and coincidence. And so... Where was he? Uh, he was in... Remember when... Were you, you go to KSU, right? I, I, like, lived in Kennesaw, and I spent a lot of time there, but I actually never was a student there, which is okay. weird. 
Well, Very so weird. there's it's a, a whole other story. Yeah, there's like a uh, there's a there's a common room area thing mm -hmm. where I guess like clubs hold their meetings and stuff, okay. and I think they got permission to use that because okay, they were doing gotcha. a skit about being in college. And so I came in, and I remember thinking their what they were doing was really funny. It was a skit called Just Enough Academy where they teach kids to get D minuses because technically that's all you need to pass. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, don't be a nerd, just like do just enough. <laughs> that's a good premise. I yeah, like I, thought, I thought it was really funny. And that's so, good. But they told me, they were like, all right, we're going to need you to just sit over there and just look high and like you don't give a fuck. And I was like, I, like I'm... I was born to play this role. Growing up Catholic, I've kind of am, have a little bit of beef with God. But when, <laughs> but when, when that happened, I was like, all right, maybe you do exist. That's just what are the odds, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm sitting there just looking all high because I, I was <laughs> and then <laughs> and then and then uh, and, and then his brother Philip was like uh, he's like I think I want to hear you say something and so they had me uh, do like a talking head like how they do on the office or whatever and I did and uh, I just was f-bombs and just said a lot of terrible things and they laughed really 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 hard but they have like a clean brand so they were like they're like we can't use that but they were like you are funny as hell dude and so uh, their director gave me his phone number. And uh, he goes, are you a comedian? And I was like, well, Brittany said I couldn't be, but I want to be. And then, <laughs> Was this the same day? Same exact day, hours later. I, wow. I know. It's, and I'm re-realizing it now that I'm telling you this. But like I might be playing it up a little with the storm cloud and the sadness yeah, part. But I that probably was like was, the whole I thing. was probably just like, I'll win the argument later. But like, <laughs> but uh, but so then I got the guy's number, and I never really thought to hit him back up for a while, uh, and then I started doing stand up, and then once I started, I finally reached out and I called him, and he answered right away. Whoa! Yeah, and he was like, "So we have we have this skit that we're doing, and uh, where we're doing a live show, and the live show was called Ratchet People Meet, and it was nice. at a, it was at a club in Atlanta called Uptown Comedy Corner." And so I went there, and the show was hilarious. It was like half sketch comedy, half stand-up comedy. It reminded, there was an old show called In Living Color. I don't know if you remember that show, but it reminded, like, Jamie Foxx, the Wayans Brothers, like, they all came from that show. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like SNL or something, or yeah, it was similar. Like, yeah, and so, uh, it, and Jim Carrey was on it, too. Which gotcha. That was like the Fire Marshal Dave thing. Was fire, that fire Marshal Bill. Fire Marshal Bill. That was from the Living Color, right? You smart. Hell yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so, but what I noticed about the show was it reminded me of In Living Color, but everybody was black. They didn't have a white guy. And I just kind of felt like, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't a race thing when I went into it. I just liked them and thought they were funny. Yeah. But at the same time, I was like, well, I will by default stick out, even if I'm brand new at this. And... Um, and so I, I just told him, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so they had me come audition So they invited you to be on it? Yeah, and Ratchet People Meet involved uh, Manuel and Philip Hudson and then everybody you see on that t-shirt. Nice. A dude named Moneybag Mafia, another another Instagram guy, f just funny as fuck. And um, if I'm for, oh, a girl, Ernestine Johnson, she's a poet. It's really good. And it just it just all came together really, really well. And so for about a year, we would go on tour and we would do like the live show and we would do everything like that. I got to do a lot of cool stuff. I got to be in a TI music video. Nice. I got to go to his birthday party, which I, and I've met him a few times and he, I'll tell you this, I'd like to act like we're friends, but he is not like, he's not amused by me. I think he thinks I'm corny. <laughs> Cause I try, I try to make him laugh and he's just not having He's it. just like, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, you could say, like what he said to Tiny, I think me and him might be at odds a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like what he said to Tiny. That video was hilarious. At odds. That's like some Civil War general <laughs> shit. But were you at odds with him? That well, shit was, that was so fucking well, funny. Well, you could say the two of us were at odds. Nah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but so, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is a weird thing. I would never say that, ever. But he does, he's like that in real life, though, <laughs> is the funniest part. And um, That's so funny. Yeah, and so I got to do a music video with him, which was really cool. Like, I'm standing right in the middle of the bluffs, like, it, literally playing like a crack dealer. And I'm like, this is so gangster. This is awesome. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, even after that, like after getting to open for Fly and stuff, it gave me an interesting uh, insight into it because I had done like the uh, the they have different words for it, but more or less just the white clubs. 
you can call them mainstream hipster clubs, whatever the fuck you want to call them. But um, it because Atlanta comedy is actually very segregated. Both mm. scenes are great, but they're they are very much still kind of segregated. Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. I would say probably uh, just a history of racism in this country, hmm. but on maybe a much more kind of passive aggressive level where it's like, but but what's interesting though- Or maybe like the relatability or something. But it's not the comedians, any, it, it, it used to be, but it's not the comedians anymore. It's the audiences. Because what'll happen is like, if you do a show that like happens to be like a very white show, right? If, if You're Nat, saying audience? Yeah, 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 in terms of audience members. If uh, if Nav were to come on that show, he murder. They would love him. It'd be great. Just as how like whenever I do a show that's like a majority like black audience, I usually get a very good reaction because like generally people are happy that they're like, oh, that's cool that you're coming here. And I will say they will boo you if you suck. But <laughs> but no but no matter what though, there is some kind of a level of respect of just being like good like good basically good for you for not stereotyping us and still coming out here anyways and just doing it just how you would do it anywhere else that's cool yeah i like that but anyways um so just i really i started on the the urban side which is a political way of saying just the black side and uh and so i kind of learned a little bit of the business of it from there and uh what was weird is i had probably only been doing it maybe a couple of months when, and you said you kind of started on a dare right what what happened oh, yeah, exactly? yeah. We, we can go back to that so uh, some friends of mine from high school, like we all said that we were like, we all consider our, ourselves to be funny. Yeah. The funny kids, troublemakers, whatever. And, uh, we were like, we would, we would literally fight over like, I'm funnier than you or like, I'm funnier than you, <laughs> but it's, it's subjective. It's not like I'm faster than you. And then you can just race and just prove it. Like comedy is subjective. It depends. Totally. And so we were like, we were like, all right, well, let's all sign up for an open mic night whoever gets the most laughs wins. And so we all sign up and I get to the I get to the show. It was at the Atlanta Improv, which is no longer there. And I remember I got there, I was nervous as shit, and I was talking to uh, my friends and I was like, okay, I'm on seventh, when are you guys going up? And they're like, oh, we didn't sign up for that shit. And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, we just figured like you'd be stupid enough to do it. <laughs> and then I was like, oh no. So they were all there to watch you. Yeah, and then so I went up and it went great. Where did you prepare? Did you have like a five minute set or something? Like uh -huh. a little five minute. Yeah, I got nice. I got in trouble though because I said not fuck but the other f word. I uh, dropped I dropped that one, and I didn't uh, I didn't know the I was, one that rhymes with maggot. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even want to say it here. Like it's just I you know. Oh, that's so funny. But it but the guy I'll like say it. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy got, I mean, I don't care, but just... I know, the, I know, I know. The guy... Because you got in trouble saying it. Comedy is a very liberal institution, and uh, it's very mm. important to keep your head above water. Hmm. But, but the, the thing is, is I got in trouble for that, and I didn't think it was a big deal. I really didn't. And I mean, I was 19, and it, in retrospect, it was a joke I would never fucking say now. Not even just because yeah. of that, but just because it, it just, wasn't it good. It just wasn't a good joke, gotcha. But, um, but was, everybody, it like, everybody, was it like the punchline Yeah, it was? Okay. Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't anti-gay. Uh, the joke was just, uh, it was uh, people, people who smoke e-cigarettes are like people who drive Priuses. Like, you think you look like you're saving the world, but really you just look like a... Yeah, a yeah. faggot. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, you think you're saving the world, but really, just like that. he said it not. That's me. funny. He, he said it not me. MTV. Just that, so you know. Yes, exactly. Will uh, Fosky has never <laughs> said that word on <laughs> on recorded record ever. But I mean, and you Louis know, Louis C.K. has a funny bit about that word. Oh, oh yeah, it's and great. several several others. But the 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 thing about that though is, is people are probably even going to listen to that and be like, "What a bitch!" Really, he won't even say it. And it's it's not about that. It was just the way it was explained to me afterwards really made me rethink the whole thing was it the burning thing well no no i knew about that i just well, like because I, I actually hear, listened to a podcast recently where they explained uh that that wasn't the case that, that like gay people will say like well you know what they call them faggots right because it's a bundle of sticks and they used to burn gay people at the stake yeah but I, but that wasn't actually true at all which is funny because it the word faggot used to be described used to be used to describe women because a bundle of sticks is really awkward to carry. Uh -huh. Like if you're carrying this bundle of sticks, and How? so they're like, they're like, oh, she's such a faggot. Meaning like she's really difficult to deal with. Like she's you're just carrying this woman along, and she's and then yeah. and then they started calling like really flamboyant men that like 
wow, he's really annoying, blah, blah, blah. Like, all that kind of stuff, and then it evolved. That's Oh, Jesus. Which well, is weird. But yeah. anyways. So they, but what they told me is, uh, first of all, they were like, would you say the N-word on stage? I was like, of course not. And then they were like, well, then there you go. Mm. And, then, and then also, and also another thing was, I kind of made myself look stupid. Because I, I was just this teenager still. And, uh, and he goes, well, you know, when you say things like gay, like it can be really offensive. And then like I tried to defend myself but made it worse. I was like, no, I didn't mean it in like homosexual. I meant it as like, you know, weird and stupid. <laughs> and, then, and then as soon as, as, soon, as soon as I said that, I was like, oh, yeah, this is why it's a huge problem that I would be saying this. <laughs> and so since then, I never have. That makes sense. I learned I learned a very important lesson that That's day. funny. Yeah, the, the thing for me is, like, I get it, the whole thing, like, a okay, gate of events, people just don't say it kind of thing. Kind well, of like the N-word. It's like, there's no reason to ever say it, so just don't. Mm -hmm. But then there's this other flip side of the coin where it's like, the more you say it, the less power the word has, right? Like, you kind of just, it kind of loses its power. The, like like when I Donald Trump it. said pussy, now you could say pussy at the dinner table and no one's going <laughs> to bat an eye. That's but, true, but the the way that the way that I look at it is is when it comes to slurs like that about like an oppressed class, whether mm. whether it's homosexuals or black people, I go with what they say because mm. they are them and have had to deal with it more. Uh, and so like any like most people I know like anybody on that shirt, if I was like, hey, can I say the N-word? They'd be like, no, fuck no. Yeah. You're cool, but no. Yeah, exactly. And exact same thing with the other way. And I just kind of look at it as like, just out of respect, like, yeah, okay, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, but it- <laughs> I feel you on that. That makes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, and then also though, like doing, um, you know, doing, doing the urban scene or whatever, I, I learned a lot about just not only like comedy, but race, re excuse me, race relations and stuff. And it, it was just, it was really cool. I'm very, very grateful that's how I got to start out. And not only that, but Fly had such a big following because he's got, now he's got five million followers. When I first met him, he had about two and a half. Wow. Which is insane. I've yeah, never two seen- two and a half million people is crazy. I've never seen that much of anything. Yeah. In my life. Yeah, and uh, and so what would happen is I was brand spanking new. I had been doing comedy maybe six months, and I would have to open for him in a crowd of like a thousand people. Whoa! Yeah, and I listened. Did you to just did you ever just eat dick? Like, uh, just fall on your face? Never. I mean, I didn't do. I didn't kill. There were times where I didn't kill, but I. It was such a big deal where I was like, I don't care what I have to do. I'm not bombing in front of a thousand people. Mm. Yeah, that's good motivation. Because if sure. you because if you bomb at an open, you you got to go to open mic nights. For us, that's the batting cages because exactly. that's where you try new stuff out. And if you bomb at an open mic night, it does not matter at all. Even even the crowd is just going to be like, I guess that thing didn't work. That's mm. kind of their mentality versus being like, oh, you suck, which is way worse. Because once somebody thinks you suck, they're gonna think you suck. Yeah. Unless you can prove to an even bigger, now I got to kill for. 5,000 people just to get those people to shut the fuck up and and all while having only done it for a couple of months it, it would just have been too much pressure yeah but and I look back on the material now I was like you're funnier than that like it was just it was a lot of just like uh, what you would expect being like well you know white people be doing stuff like this but black people be doing stuff like this and it, it worked but like looking back on it I'm just kind of like I can do better than that yeah you're above that now yeah, or I wouldn't even say I'm above it. If I had a more clever way to set up the joke that wasn't so like 1990s Def Jamish, <laughs> then I then I would. <laughs> but like just just kind of looking back on it, uh, yeah. it was it was sort of just like uh, well, and then and then now <laughs> it's so funny to use this word because I also am a white guy. But like now that I've like crossed over, it's just it's really interesting to see how the two scenes are very different. For example on the on the black side or urban side whatever um if you you can like you can call a woman a bitch if you want i mean if i did it it would look pretty weird like if mm. i was like this bitch yeah it would just wouldn't make sense and so it, it probably wouldn't work because people would be like no the fuck you don't talk like that and uh and uh <laughs> but you can do that but if I were to make a joke about how the Catholic Church is hypocritical and organized religion is stupid, mm -mm, not going to work. 
Whereas in a white crowd, you're saying, or no, a black a, crowd? a black crowd. Whereas in like at least maybe in down in downtown, in this in like in the outskirts where it's more like Baptist and shit, that's a little bit different. But in in like downtown Atlanta, in like the Atlanta comedy scene, or probably most major scenes on the on the white scene, you can you can talk about abortion, you can talk about a religion, you can talk about pretty much whatever the fuck you want. But don't call a woman a bitch, or don't you know what I'm saying? It's hmm. di- different people. There's different taboos for the different scenes. You're saying it's more like from what I. It's like on one side, it's like the language is the is the pro, is is the trigger, quote unquote. Whereas on the other one, the content is the trigger. So it's in other words, one of them, it's like you can say whatever you want, however you want to say it, but you better not say it about this one thing. Whereas on the other side, it's more like you can say. You can talk about anything that you want, but you better not say these specific things when you talk about it. Hmm. Which one was which? I was like lo- kind of losing you there. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. So So like in the beginning you were saying you can well, talk on, Yeah, on the urban scene you can definitely like you can be like and then I was like, "Shut up, bitch." and whatever. But then if if you're if if I was like, "So, uh, I don't think God's real." I've immediately lost everybody. I mean, I wouldn't say that probably anywhere. <laughs> But that that is, I would have a unless much more clever way of getting my point across. Yeah, unless you were really, unless it was like a weird setup where you were really trying to dig yourself into a hole just so you could dig yourself back out or something. I do that a lot. But <laughs> it's um, actually kind of funny. But so yeah, and then whereas on the on the other scene, like like even now, like because I do it so much, I'm so uncomfortable even just like using that like as an example. But I could I could talk about abortion, I could talk about religion, I could talk about whatever I wanted, but. There's just the tr- there's just trigger words you got to stay away from in the white crowds you're saying yeah and and this is also I'm just very much generalizing oh, of these course, two of things course. there's definitely some crossover that's and this isn't everywhere but to to kind of stereotype it a little bit that's what it is hmm. or at that least that's what I've seen in my experience that's kind of funny yeah I feel like I've noticed that a lot like for example uh, like with my parents or something like. We could be we could be watching anything, but mm-hmm. as soon as like someone s- swears or something, then it's like oh, right. But 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 the content could be whatever. Yeah, of and course. And that's kind of how like like you know for example, my parents have listened to my podcast and something. They're like, oh, why do you have to swear? Kind of thing. <laughs> and actually, kind of because I'm a real motherfucker, mom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, well, you don't swear around me. And I'm like, well, that's because I know it. You know, I know that it bothers you, so I you know I try not to do it. And you know, but. If yeah. I'm being my, I explained it totally in my, I, I have these like weekly updates that I'm doing and I explained it in the one that I just released like yesterday. So basically if you want to hear about that, go to the weekly update number three and hear all about it. But anyways. Little shameless plug there. Yeah. Right. Don't listen to that episode. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, basically it was, the main reason is I don't want to filter myself and I don't want to like filter my guests either. Sure. I want it to be as open and raw as possible. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to f- force myself to swear just to be cool yeah like we got a good fucking episode for you today sometimes you can tell Yeah, like like in the intro if i was like what's up everybody another motherfucking episode (laughs) of the andrew deitch podcast i would turn it off (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) what's up bitch ass motherfuckers i'd be like somebody is trying a little too hard to be a man of the people (laughs) have you ever seen that video of the middle schooler kids that like one of them hits a rock on a skateboard oh yeah yeah, and he's like oh this it was that damn ass fucking ass rock yeah (laughs) yeah He's just like, he knows he's being filmed and he's trying to be cool, so he's just swearing as much as possible. That damn ass fucking ass rock. I totally remember that. That video is hilarious. Yeah, the kid's like, he's like, ah! And the other kid's crying because he fell off his skateboard. He's like, yeah, man, uh, it was this damn ass fucking ass gay ass rock. <laughs> and what's what's so fucked up about that is like, that kid probably has YouTube money now, and meanwhile, I'm in this fucking crappy ass room. <laughs> Working my ass off talking to you, explaining the process. Exactly. This Whereas is the, the process. Because some idiot, stupid little punk fell off his scooter. And now he's <laughs> got all, all, all of the followers. All of the followers, man. That's what happens. You get one viral video like that and you just pop off. I've thought about that too. I've thought about like, you know, I bet it'd be so easy to go viral if I really wanted. I could do the loud challenge if I needed to. Do you know what that is? <laughs> is it just when you go somewhere and be as loud as possible? No, it's, they used to do it. I don't know if they still do, but like these kids, <laughs> they would smoke blunts in like Best oh, Buy and shit. Oh, loud. Yeah. I see. For some of our uh, older listeners, loud is urban vernacular for potent marijuana. 
the scent is very loud. Yeah, if it could be a sound, it would be very loud. But yes. it's a smell. It's I, 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 loud was one of those words where when I heard it, I immediately was like, I get why you say that. Yeah, like, you're like, man, turn turn my weed down. Yeah, no. yeah, it makes it makes sense because there's no the other word would just be like, mm, that is a potent smell. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're not smoking with us anymore. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but wow. The, Gee, fellas, this is some hell of a devil's lettuce. But that <laughs> this jazz cabbage is a little bit too potent. <laughs> oh man, that reminds me. I got in trouble. I'll tell you about some times I got in trouble doing stand up. I definitely need to hear those. So I did a uh, I did a show at an old folks home. <laughs> oh God! In Canton. <laughs> Was this supposed to be clean? Uh, yeah. Were but, you? But I I interpret because my act is filthy, and I've been trying to work on maybe having more jokes about like the grocery store or like not not being so goddamn polarizing yeah. about everything. W- filthy as in like you're talking about like wh- what kind of filthy stuff are you talking I don't, about? The thing, I don't talk about sex. That's what I was. Gonna, that's I what think, I, was thinking. I think it annoys me. Like sex is funny when Louis talks about it because he's like fifty. And you're like, oh, that is funny, the idea of you having sex. Yeah. But, like, when, I, when I'm when i at clubs and I see, like, a young guy talking about, like, getting pussy, I'm just kind of like, God, gross. Like, mm-hmm. there's no, like, first of all, people aren't laughing. And second of all, like, women can't possibly be like, but you know who I liked the most? Was that guy who wouldn't <laughs> shut up about his boner. <laughs> like, have a little class, man. Yeah, exactly. And, no one wants to hear it. Yeah, talk about how white people be driving versus how black people be driving. Like, grow the fuck up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, <laughs> but uh, so anyways, More sophistication, please. Yeah, and so yeah, talk about how white people be operating automobiles. Yeah, versus, but so I'm at the old folks' home. Anyways, flash forward, and uh, all of us, all the comedians, we're all just laughing like there's such a thing as a hell gig. They have that in all different kinds of, of worlds. And this was a hell gig if I've ever seen one. Like, I remember we were, we got there and we were all just outside like, all right, let's just all agree not to judge each other for how badly each one of us is about to do. Cause there's, cause there's no possible way that any of us are coming out on top. No one is killing tonight. But so listen to what happened though. This is what, so I admit, I contributed in a major way to why we got in a lot of trouble. But so I thought it would be funny. And and I was kind of maybe just trying to make the other comics laugh. Oh, totally. It, and also, they weren't just old. Like, they were, like, old. Deathbed old. old. Like, they looked like... They're in a home. I mean, like, they're in there to die. Yeah, they just looked like they were just just a... Just a sea of oatmeal raisin cookies with glasses. That's like what I was like staring out and looking at. And uh, and so I get up on stage. I start my set off by saying, uh, yeah, I know I look like the grandkid that doesn't send thank you notes. And trust me, I don't. Oh, <laughs> shit. And then, this is the only crowd where that would have been offensive yeah exactly it's so benign but it was just like it was it was i admit it was very inappropriate and i was just doing it to i was newer at the time and i was like i'll be such a little badass (laughs) but it's like if you're gonna pick someone to rebel against why why are you gonna pick the most defenseless one Mm. like that's kind of that's kind of lame but in retrospect (laughs) it's just kind of funny to be like man i was such a piece of shit i can't believe i did that and so and and uh so anyways I followed that up with, because some people laughed, like some people actually laughed, and then I followed it and was like, some of you look shocked, and you might be wondering like, oh, I hope my grandson would never say something like that about me, and I was like, trust me, he does. Like, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) and so I'm not off to a great start. And then I was like... Uh, Did did the people who did laugh, did they just not laugh at that? Did they get any laughs? I kept thinking I was killing, because my comedian friends were laughing. Because they were just like, you idiot. Like, I can't believe this is what you're doing. And then when you said jazz cabbage, that's what reminded me. It's because I have a joke about weed. And I described it as jazz cigarettes. <laughs> but the, but a lot of people laughed. But as soon as they did that, I saw like a nurse be like, and like run over and like tap somebody on the shoulder. Immediately I get the light. And so I... Call, the light? The light, the light meaning time to wrap it up. Oh. And so, is there like an actual lighter where they just like... 
doing um, this kind of thing. A lot of clubs will have a light in the back, and then if it's at like a bar or somewhere like that, somebody will just flash you with the phone. Just okay. to kind of let you know, like, hey, your time's up. Okay, cool. And uh, and so anyways... But this was at an old folks' home, right? Yeah, so it was a flashlight. Okay, I see. No, it was it was some guy's <laughs> fucking life alert. They were waving <laughs> in the air. And so... Uh, <laughs> and so the, uh, I closed my set by saying... And this was when I went for the Hail Mary. I was just like, fuck all of this. I don't care at all. We all made an agreement. And I'm just gonna drop an atomic bomb on this audience. And I, I said, uh, I was like, I was like, you know, I really envy you guys. I really do. Y'all get to live here. You're at the end of the road. Like you guys, you, you made it, you know. And I was like, and if you know, if I was living here, there's one thing that I would be doing that I hope you guys are doing each and every day. Uh, I would be trapping my medication. I would be selling oxycotton. I would be selling all of. I would be raking in so much money. <laughs> And Did I, I come to you when you were on the stage? Yeah, and I was like, if, I was like, if any of you, if any of you have any, uh, I'll be happy to buy some later. So uh, take <laughs> oh, care, guys. Fuck. Left to no applause, and the MC coming up and going, okay. Uh, <laughs> and then so <laughs> you this, know it's bad when the guy that comes up next is, is saying, um, alrighty then. Yeah, okay. I've, I, I've had to do that a few times whenever I've hosted things. Oh no. And I, you know, I don't hold it against people. Sometimes it just happens. And uh, but then the the headliner goes up. And he's also bombing. And keep in mind, even even the people who have killed the hardest probably got no more than six or seven laughs out of like the thirty old people that were there. Whoa, that's harsh. Yeah, and so, but then this guy make me laugh. Funny yeah, guy. this guy gets up and he does this racist joke about Jews, and then everybody laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, it's fucked up. and I was just sitting there. I was like, of course, like fucking, of course. Oh, fucking, of course, these old people in Canton hate Jews. So that's, of course, that, that that's why that would be funny. Oh, my gosh. That's and I, hilarious. But I laughed so hard, not at the joke, because the joke was just offensive and bad. But I was just laughing because everybody, like, people who were like this the whole time were like, ha, 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 yeah, yeah stupid Jews. Yeah, Jews. <laughs> This guy gets it. And then I, I went, I, I leaned over to my friend Terrell and I was like, I was like, dude, I guess we could have just been racist this whole time and it would have worked probably. Yeah. But we don't because we're good people. Yep. But I just thought it was just really funny. And I was just like, that is funny. I was like, you know, in the back of my head, I totally should have seen that coming. But I was like, no, no, it's 2017. No, we have grown as a country. No. Not them. Not them at all, dude. Can't that, teach an old dog new tricks, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, another another thing I thought maybe would be interesting. To sh- Are we good? Like, can we keep going? Yeah, of course. Okay. We're totally good, man. Cool. But I, I know have, you usually do. Do you have to get out of here at some point? I have to be somewhere at like 7, and it's like 6. No, wait, what time is it? It's like 5.30. Oh, yeah, we're totally good, dude. Cool. I have to be somewhere around then, too, so. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we got, whenever yeah. whenever you need to go then. Um, no, well, so <laughs> going back to the Ratchet People Meet Day. So I'm not I'm not with them anymore. I'm no longer under like a management thing. Gotcha. I just kind of try to do it on my own mm-hmm. and just try to build it up like the organic way, kind of like how how you're doing it. And um, and uh, if you got if you guys are listening, I sure would appreciate your support. Yes, of course. And uh, I, I promise. I'll link all of his uh, yeah. stuff in the description, of course. Yeah, I promise. If you uh, if you come to uh, if you come to see me at, uh, at at shows, I won't make your grandparents sad. <laughs> Just don't bring them. Yeah, don't bring your fucking. Just grandparents. don't bring them. There'll be no opportunity to make them sad. Yeah, don't bring your bitch ass grandparents. I'll be <laughs> I'll be mad as fuck if you do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're not bitch asses. They're fine. But uh, so I, one cool thing I, I really got to do that I, I guess would maybe be a little podcast worthy. I um, towards the end of my time with Ratchet People Meet, I went to Los Angeles to try out for Wild and Out with Nick Cannon, and we had a we had an audition here, and I, I passed it, and then I went out to California, and then I lost miserably. But it did teach me a lot of just kind of how like things worked a little bit. Because that was like, comedy is kind of a sport in a way. Mm. Like, because I was like, damn it, this is why I wanted to do this. Because I, 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 I didn't have to compete against people. 
and then I got there in a because it's an it's an improv based game show, but they still get stand ups on it as well. And so when I got out there, are you familiar with the show? I've watched it a few times. Like I know they have like little segments, and they kind of have like um, this battle kind of things, right? Yeah. Where they're trying yeah, to yeah, yeah. they're trying to roast each other. It's like it's like hip hop. Whose line is it anyway? That's ba- uh, that's basically what. It, and then Nick Cannon is like the Drew Carey of. of that it always kind of reminded me also of Yo Mama. Yo Mama was the shit. In fact, I just did a show with a guy who was on Yo Mama. Like I know, really? I, yeah, I know about five or six people who were on this. Nav, the guy on the right hand corner of that, he was on Yo Mama when, he, when he was in high school. That's awesome. I always loved watching Yo Mama when I was younger. Cash money. Yeah, that they would just say the most ridiculous stuff. Wilmer Valderrama. <laughs> Any, uh, so, anyways, so I flew out there. I remember th- I thought that was cool as shit. I was like, I am in Los Angeles right now, and I will the in- haven, like the. What? place to be for stand-up kind it, of kind of if you want to get famous if you want to get good go to new york mm. that's kind of the thing i feel you and there's just way more clubs in new york right oh yeah and i mean a lot of them are just shitty terrible open mics where the only other people in the crowd are other comics but you can do you can probably do seven eight sets a night that's crazy if you really grind it and you really do it right totally and so um and i mean even in in atlanta um I've just been gone a lot lately and I haven't been doing it as much, but generally my routine is there'll be a lot of nights where I'll do two, sometimes even three shows in a night. How long are your sets typically? It depends on where you go. Mm. There are some shows where you can only do two minutes. There are some where you can do 10. There's some where they might let you do 15. And, and it, all, it all just kind of depends. Like, um, How long would the headliner go for? Or if there is one? So if there is a headliner, it's customary that if it's at a, if it's at a comedy club, it would be a, they would do generally 45, probably wow. 45 to an hour. But right now I'm in a spot where I would either be like opening or maybe hosting. Gotcha. And, uh, and so on, there's a fucking ant in here. My house is a fucking mess. That's what I get. I, if you can't see it, but my room is so dirty, but, um, anyways, um, yeah, that's usually what they would do. And then, like, the host does, like, five at the beginning. This is also assuming that it's a traditional stand-up show. Yeah. Which you can see maybe, like, the punchline, the laughing skull, uptown. But nowadays, uh, what's interesting is the format has changed a lot. It's a lot more underground, kind of uh, indie kind of, way, kind of way about doing it. Like, breweries. There are more shows at breweries now than there are comedy clubs in the United uh, States. Why do you think that is? Um, the, first of all, there's money to be made. Like breweries just in general are just making a killing. It's almost hard not to make a ton of money. Like yeah. if, if you just, if you just make a thick beer with like a little like cartoon of like a snake on it, like every college <laughs> You're kid, here, folks. Yeah. Every college kid everywhere is just going to be like, Oh, I haven't tried that one yet, bro. I got to try that shit out. Oh, it's called the, 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 the hopsicobra. Hops a cobra. You heard it here first. We're gonna. We're I was gonna really talk pulling to... for a name. I was pulling for a name. I didn't think I was gonna come up with one. And they're like, I really like how the thing that you use to open it is orange instead of silver. That made me is what made me buy it. Oh, you're right. It's so <laughs> unique. Like I just appreciate those details. You know, and I just lo- something you don't get from the typical. And I love how unreasonably expensive it is because it makes me feel like I'm important when I the drink it. The more expensive it is, the more important I feel. So, <laughs> I mean, it's the and more I, expensive, the better. I love case. how impossibly dry my mouth gets after I have like three sips. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> By the way, IPAs, we totally love you. We're, this is weird, just fucking with you out of love. That's all this is. <laughs> Except for no, <laughs> except for you, sweet. Oh no, I'm just kidding. I love sweet water. I love sweet water too. Sweet water's great. In fact, I'm doing a show. Uh, if you guys are listening to this, uh, July 3rd, I'm doing a show at the Sweetwater Brewery in downtown Atlanta. No shit, that's awesome. Yeah, it's and well, this also like I'll use that show as an example. That was actually the first brewery show in the country. Wow, really? Yeah, a, a comedian from Atlanta. Where do they do the Where do they do the show upstairs? Uh, they used to. I think they do it downstairs now, but it's still it's still a good show. It's huge. You can bring your dogs if you want. Huh. Um, well, and, and so my friend... Uh, and it's hipster as fuck. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. You but, can bring your dog. Yeah, but the people who you see there, I would say, because it's not a hipster audience. Mm-mm. Star Bar is maybe a little bit more. Gotcha. But I kind of don't even like that word just because it's kind of dismissive. It's overplayed. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, these are just people who like, like art. Mm, and I, I, I will admit... 
the before I knew them, it was my favorite thing ever to do was just make fun of them. Just, just like just like frat kids, like of course there's so much you can make fun of them, but it it doesn't matter. Once you know if, them, if, they're if, just they're your, if they're in your audience, like you just you just let them be, and unless they provoke you, and then you can you can mm. go hard. Like if a if a hipster pisses you off, you can be like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you're very confident when your dad's paying for your fucking art studio that nobody <laughs> even fucking goes to. You can say so, or if like uh, if if a if a frat bro starts heckling you or something, you can be like, yeah, uh huh, yeah, I'm sure, and I'm sure you're on old row putting hashtag change back, even though you're from fucking Ohio. Like <laughs> people are just people are in. People are just fun to make fun of. How do you deal with hecklers? Like, did it piss you off in the beginning? Yeah, I used to not know how to do it, but now I try to make them cry in the car. Mm. I go, I go so hard now. The savage, and you don't even. If Have I you do, ever, like seen someone after the show and they're legitimately mad at you. Yeah, I did a roast uh, about two weeks ago. Some friends of mine were some friends of mine were leaving for Colorado. And generally, when comedians leave town to move somewhere else, they get their friends together and they do a roast. And they live up in Chattanooga, but I go there fairly often, so I came up and uh, we did the roast. And the guy who went on before me uh, wasn't that good of friends with them. I had never seen him before. And normally, I'm very nice. Like, I'm, well, maybe people listening to this will be like, "No, Foskey was a fucking asshole." But I think I'm pretty. <laughs> Back nice. in high school, he called me a dick. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so, uh, and so. Anyways, he gets on stage. He's, I think he's a new comic. And another thing is he asked to be on the roast. And that's not what you do. Like, you let the people being roasted invite you. Like, that's, that's kind so of... So if I was being roasted and I, I would invite you rather than like, hey, man, can I, can I roast you? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. If you were the guy being roasted and I was like, can I roast you? You would have every right to be like, get the fuck out. No, I don't know you that well. No. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be perfectly reasonable. And so, but that's kind of what happened with this guy. And granted, if anyone, even if it had been somebody famous, if anyone had bombed as bad as this kid did, I would have said the same thing. Like, I literally got on stage and I was like, what was your name? And he told me his name and I was like, quit comedy and kill yourself. I was like, that was, I was like, that was terrible. And then like the crowd started laughing and I was like, hear how they're all laughing at what I said? That's because it's true. That was really, really bad. Like, look, look me in the eyes. You're really bad at this. Oh, fuck. Yeah. And as soon as I said it, and I was only being that mean because I was scared of other people being mean to me. Yeah, because you have to a, go but, hard. But it's a roast. Like, you have to, you have to come out on top. Oh, it's so true. And so, anyway, so that happened. And then uh, <laughs> after, the guy goes, you know, I've been uh, struggling with suicidal thoughts for like a really long time. And I might, but, but also though, because I'm such a pussy, is after I roast people, like the, after the whole roast, I was like walking up, like, I'm so sorry, dude. Like, you know, we're cool. Like, I, I just did it because we had to. That's what I would do too. Yeah, I'm, it's, it's hard. It's hard to look somebody in the face. And because you don't really hate them. No, of course not. But, but that guy really did suck. Yeah, and it wasn't his fault. And uh, he's just new and just stuck his nose where he maybe shouldn't have. But at the same time, I've had things like that happen to me. And I got real sad about it, but you just you you, you do it, and it makes you tougher, and it, you just put up with it. And uh, but I just remember he told me that, and part of me was like, you know, I had no way of knowing that, and I told like nine other people to kill themselves during my <laughs> roast. That was kind of my nails in the coffin for every person was just like, oh, and by the way, kill yourself. <laughs> but like. Oh man, roasts are fun though. But uh, but also just with with hecklers, if somebody interrupts me, I'll generally just be like, I'll be like, oh yeah, no, I know you think you're important, I know. And then usually people get embarrassed and stop, usually because they're good people and they're like, and they're like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have opened up my stupid mouth and yeah. said anything. And because the thing for all, <laughs> that's what I would do if I was, if I was just trying to be funny. Because I think a lot of people that watch comedy are also. They think they're funny too, mm -hmm. and they're like, they're like, well, I'm qualified to say something about this because I don't get this one particular thing that you said. Mm. When in when in reality, it's like maybe if you just wait and let them do the fucking whole time that they're supposed to do, then you wouldn't have these questions. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if if somebody usually I'll do that and try to get them to stop, but then and this is for all you potential hecklers listening to this, if you think that you're helping the show. 
and that the rest of the crowd is going to be on your side, you are dead ass wrong. That crowd hates you because they've they've paid money or they've gotten a babysitter or they, they've done whatever they needed to do to be there and hang out. They've waited in line to get drinks like and now you are fucking shit up for them, which is why sometimes people will be like, Damn, you came on a little harsh, dude. And I was like, yeah, because they need to fucking know. <laughs> like I did. I did. A, dude, I did a show in uh, Columbia and there was a girl and she I mean, she was just as white trash as you could possibly be. And her, her skin just looked like a fucking leather wallet. <laughs> and uh, A leather wallet. Yeah, and so I had just done a joke about the probation office, like just making fun of that. And, um, and then she goes, she goes, I didn't like what you had to say about the probation office or whatever. And then I was just like, oh, excuse me. I was like, does, does the Waffle House know that you're on your meth break right now? Oh shit! Just little during things the like, show, she heckled and said that. Yeah, and sometimes when you're on stage, she was, so from the crowd, she said, "I don't like what you said about the probation office." It didn't come out like I put it in English. She was like, "I did you said about the probation office." That's <laughs> kind of more what it sounds. But I'm guessing that's what she was saying. She was saying something about the probation office, or probably more likely, I spend a lot of time at the probation office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so fucking funny. You said, what'd you say? I, I said, didn't know I that. asked if the Waffle House knew that she was on her meth break. That's amazing. And and I felt horrible, but at the same time, she was interrupting the entire show, and I was just kind of like, well, shh. Like, just shut up. And <laughs> what it, did she do after you said that? Uh, she kept talking, and then I proceeded to roast her more, and then finally, she just, like, gave up. That's hilarious. And did, did, does normally, like, did the club staff do anything with hecklers? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did they kick them out? Yeah. In, but in this case, they were just letting her go or what? She was a regular. I think that's what was explained to me. She was a regular, and I think she might have just had a little too many. And like, uh, in, and like I said, even afterwards, like, I went up to her and I was like, hey, n- nothing personal. It's just like, I am in, Col- I'm from fucking Atlanta, and I'm in Columbia right now, and I did not drive up here to have your stupid ass fucking talking in my ear while I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it, I get it sounds kind of fucked up. Like, just be like, God, he's such a dick. How could he just say that to somebody who just wants to laugh? But it's like, dude, no, it, nobody's going to look in through that window during this podcast and be like, pussy. <laughs> like, no one's going to do that to you. Exactly. And if they did, you would want to have stuff in the can. And sometimes, like, when you're on stage, you can look around and you can kind of see who's going to be a problem. So while you're telling, because most of your jokes you have memorized, and while you're saying them in your head, you can kind of be like, okay, that guy over there, I know what I'm going to say to him. Okay, meth head lady, okay. Uh, like, so you're he- just like loading your bullets, kind of. Yeah. Like, there, I got I got heckled, but it's just, it's just knowing, like, it's just observing. That's like why roasting is so fun, is it's just observing stuff. Like, I just did a show where I got heckled by a guy, uh, and he, uh, his shirt was like unbuttoned, and he had a cast on. And he kept making fun of me, and I was like, is that cast why you couldn't button your shirt up the rest of the fucking way? <laughs> That's clever. Just little shit like that. And and What was he making fun of you about? What did he say? Uh, I was doing a joke about uh, how I don't think that Donald Trump is doing a very good job running this country. Ah. And it turns out that that's a very unpopular opinion in these, in these parts. Oh, I see. And, and so rather than letting me explain myself, he, uh, he just went, he just went in because the because the joke is is like i'm i mean i'm a i'm a comedian whose parents are from the north it's no fucking secret that i lean a little bit more to the left on things but like you know it's uh the the what's so weird is like conservatives and liberals in the audience are honestly just as bad as each other and they don't fucking realize it totally and i i will say in my experience like uh I did a show. I did a show in Woodstock, where uh, which is where I grew up, and I was doing a bunch of jokes about like being a liberal and stuff. And of course, I'm not. I'm not going to preach to fucking anybody. No, that, that's not my. You're mi- not trying to convert anyone. No, and I don't care. It's fucking America, dude. Like, believe believe your shit. It doesn't matter, really. And and so and I'm not even that fucking liberal. It's just like, how about we just be a little nicer and just maybe be more careful with who we let run for president next time. 
And I mean that on both sides. Yep. But agreed. But, but anyway, um, <laughs> I, I made a joke about it while I was on stage. I think Connor might have even been at this show, and uh, they were like, there were just a bunch of uh, these rednecks. They just had their arms crossed, you know. But what was so funny is like, had I been doing the flip side, had I been doing like conservative material and maybe a more liberal area, somebody might have piped up and said something. But it seemed like a lot of these like maybe like country folk, like they were just sitting there like, well, son, I I, I don't agree with what you're saying, but God damn it, if I don't believe in your right to do it, <laughs> like yeah. shit like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> It's so true. And, uh, <laughs> and I mean, Freedom what of I, speech, he's right. Exactly. That's funny. But I've been, I have a new joke that I want to try out. It's about, uh, cause like my whole, I was just with my family and they're all super conservative. And the joke was, it's like, I'm outnumbered. There's nothing I can do. But what I could do is tell the, uh, is tell the kids, cause they're from China. They don't know anything about America really. So I can tell the kids like liberal fairy tales to trick them into thinking what I think. Like, I could be like, there was a magical wizard named Bernie Sanders, and he was going to make all of our debt disappear, and we didn't have to pay any money or anything. That was the best part. But then this evil, evil war monster came down from the kingdom of New York and somehow tricked all the people in the southern kingdoms into liking him, even though normally they hate people from that kingdom. And you would think, and you would think, that it would be really obvious who would win between these two people. But it wasn't that simple because during the primary jousting match, the the former uh, first queen uh, beat him. Ah, so she, you, she was sending secret letters. She was, to, yeah, she was sending secret letters that made people really upset. And when people found her collection, her private collection of these letters, <laughs> That she was under investigation by the the police. And then everybody in the kingdom who liked the wizard now had to like her by default and felt very, very conflicted by this. Indeed. Because because although she was horrible, I don't know. Just yeah. you, you get you get where I'm going with this. But it's but we're in, talking about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Yeah, if we, if in we case you weren't clear, following along, if we weren't clear. The evil war monster from New York who tricked rednecks into liking him is one hundred percent none other than Donald Trump. But like, but and the, the crazy warmonger that we're also talking about is Hillary Clinton. That's also correct. <laughs> but I still, to this day, Bernie, you are a magical wizard, and I love you, dog. Feel the burn like a motherfucker. Even wow. though, even though it is totally, totally unrealistic. Shout out, Burn Dog. Shout out to Bernie, make, making our problems disappear. <laughs> but the but one thing though is a lot of times now, like political comedy is sometimes funny, but like now it's like politics are such a joke as it is. Mm, sometimes it's just too easy. Yeah, exactly. Like like, for instance, that joke. I do that because it's making it into like the joke is more about the way children's fairy tales sound versus what i'm talking about i can mm -hmm. do that about anything yeah totally and, and um and but anyways like some sometimes it's just like i would never like get on stage and just be like and, I, and people do it and sometimes it's funny but i would never in spite of whatever the fuck i think i would never get on stage and just be like Donald Trump is an asshole. Unless I had something really funny and specific to say. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Totally. But, and, and you just, you see that shit happen so much. And I don't know. It's because comedy is a very like liberal institution. So it, it does work out in my favor. But at the same time, there's a whole country of people that could like you. And they could very well be like the, the rednecks in, in Woodstock who are like, I might not agree with what this, this little snowflake is up here saying, but God damn it, if he doesn't have the right to be up there doing it. <laughs> and, I, and, if, and if that... And, I love that and line. It, and if, but God damn it, if he don't have the right to be up there doing it. Yeah, and if that's how you feel, I fuck with you. Regardless of whatever we, whatever we think about other stuff, if you think that, you can totally come to I my comedy show. I love the whole show. agree to disagree thing. Yeah. Because it's like, I, I, agree, I, I don't agree with what you're saying, but I respect what you're saying yeah and, and plus it's like i'm kidding like th that was one of the f there was oh the, that's the biggest thing there i mean of course there's like an element of truth to it or whatever but like the best heckler response i ever saw is there's this comedian named moshe kasher he's mm. it's actually really cool doesn't he, he have a new show 
problematic. Yeah. It's actually really good. I haven't watched it yet. Like he'll have, he has this thing called like, how do you exist? And like, <laughs> and he'll, ha he'll have like a, he'll have like a black gay Republican <laughs> like on the show and he'll be like, how do you exist? <laughs> That's such but, a good idea. But it's really, it's really cool. Like how he, how he does it and stuff. And so, um, <laughs> I'm sure the arms cross guy would be like, mm -mm, that's just the media out it again, just shoving it right down our throats. But it's, I personally think it's really cool. But he, anyway, so Moshe Kasher, he was on stage and he had one of the funniest heckler responses I ever saw. Somebody's like, I don't like what you said about whatever. And he goes, but I was kidding. He's like, this whole time I've been kidding. And he just kind <laughs> of said that. That's what people forget. They're going, they're paying. Yeah. To, to see someone tell jokes. Yeah, and like, and sometimes, I don't know what the fuck people were expecting. They're like, uh-uh, I paid money to sit here and have people think the exact same things that I think the way that I think them. Mm -hmm. That's just unrealistic. Totally. And, and I quite think frankly, the, I, I think, don't want to live in a country where that's the way things are. I think that people like that are obviously silly and delusional because it's like, that comedy is kind of the opposite of that. It's like... It's subversive. Listening to someone say things that you typically wouldn't have thought of yeah. or like pointing something out that like especially with observational comedy you know like pointing something out that you haven't thought of and maybe haven't considered in that way one of my favorite things about comedy is when someone presents something in the beginning that i'm like they're setting up the joke and i'm like hmm i don't know about that and then throughout the joke they prove me wrong yeah and then i'm like damn he's right like yeah. shit I, I have been thinking about it wrong do you have an time. example of that that you've thought of not off the top of my head but the, i know of like moments like that when i'm like ah he's kind of right like like the other day um i listened to a lot of uh, joe rogan's podcast <laughs> okay hell yeah and so he has a lot of comedians on and stuff and they talk about comedy a lot also boy does that guy have opinions about things oh he does for sure <laughs> And, but sometimes, you know, the thing that I appreciate about Joe Rogan is that even though he does have very, very rigid opinions, he's not afraid to, he's not afraid to uh, recall what he said. Like, I agree. He's not afraid to say, damn, I was wrong and, and like change his opinion on something if, if he's genuinely changed or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And Which I, is really cool. I respect the hell out of that. <laughs> it's just sometimes when he gets into like all like the aliens and stuff like okay yeah i'm just like all right joe rogan you went too you went too far down the rabbit hole stop eating dmt for breakfast bro like stop <laughs> like <laughs> like come on bro but that's that's totally true yeah but 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 i think everything with a grain of salt is you know yeah you have to take everything with a grain of salt anyways but one thing i remember with joe rogan the other day is he was saying something weird about um Who's the guy that has that like married his his adopted daughter or whatever? Uh, uh wait, what? There's some famous actor or oh, director or Woody, something. Woody Allen? Yeah, Woody Allen. And he like adopted this like Japanese girl when she was like three or something and now they're dating. I don't know. Okay, just so anyway. we're all clear, we're not 100% sure if it's Woody Allen, but because because we're millennials and that guy made movies in the 70s. Exactly. I I could but be wrong. It could very well be. Him. But anyways, it's it, it, whoever the guy is that's if Woody Allen is not dating his daughter then this is it, this is false. But anyways, they were talking about this situation on the show. One thing that he pointed out was he was like he was like that's super weird and gross, but then on but then he kind of was like, "Well, maybe like Maybe we're the weird ones. Maybe we're thinking about it this way. And at first, I totally disagreed. Uh -huh. And then, like, the way that he kind of was like, well, maybe we're just kind of just, like, stuck in our ways and blah, blah, blah. He's like, because they're not really related. And, like, if that's how they're related. And, like, it was still <laughs> very, very weird. And I don't think he fully agreed with what he was saying. I think, I think he was they just, were just being I think smart he was just kind of Just I think, to soften the... I think he was just trying to make the topic interesting because, like, him <laughs> and the guest also just kind of agreed that it was a gross situation. But, like... Yeah, because that's he no pointed, fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you have to play the devil's advocate. Like, you know, if oh, I... I have, bet he was mad, too. Like, I bet he's like, well... I guess I have to have this opinion. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have to say this now about this. Well, guys, but, but, what what if uh, what if though they were dating? Yeah, right? yeah, but what if? Yeah, th that's that's the. Remember when I hosted thing. Fear Factor? <laughs> now I'm now I'm here fucking explaining the universe. 
Hey guys, remember when I uh, used to uh, make people eat cow testicles? <laughs> yeah, I was I was literally yelling at them, forcing them to eat. Ca- yeah, now that's me, the guy that's trying to explain <laughs> the universe to you. I love Joe Rogan though, man. Yeah, he's he's, he's awesome. I remember Connor told me that he was a, a Rogan fan, and I was like, "You didn't need to tell me that." <laughs> yeah, like, I, <laughs> I just knew. You knew. I knew that from the start. Yeah, that, that's the thing about Rogan is he. He has so many different like sides to him that, mm-hmm. that make him interesting. And there's some sides where I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. And then there's some sides where I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah. Like that I can really appreciate. But well, I'm curious about you just real quick because we've been talking a lot about comedy and stuff. Yeah. Like what, who are some of, if you have any uh, favorite comics of yours? That's a good and question. And I'll tell you why you're wrong. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I really have always loved Brian Regan growing up. Of course. Up. Dude, that, it's funny you bring him up. Because he's clean. His comedy is clean. And I think he's probably one of the most unanimously respected comedians amongst other comedians. Totally. And I've actually listened to Joe Rogan's podcast where he talks to Brian Regan. And, um, oh, that's cool. I need to watch that. That one. And there's also a Nerdist podcast with um, uh, What's His Face. I don't really listen to that podcast anymore. Chris Hardwick? Yeah, Chris Hardwick's podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Chris, he's funny sometimes. Chris Hardwick. I like him. I like At Midnight. It's he's actually a good, pretty funny. He's a good host. There yeah. are some people who are really good hosts and aren't particularly that funny on their own. Ah, uh, yeah. I feel you with that. But anyways, Plus I listen to... Plus the whole, to, like, cool nerd vibe sometimes annoys me. Totally. A thousand percent. So, I, sometimes. Yes. In, in his case, it does. It's yes. like, you don't, like, you could, like... His whole angle didn't make sense because I watched his stand-up special and I was like, you could get girls. And like this whole like, I'm a nerd thing, like it's just confusing to people. Yep. Yeah. Just, yeah. Unless you have like a picture of I've you never as even a... watched. I've never even watched his uh, stand-up, to be honest. I just have listened to his podcast because I knew it was like popular and he always has cool guests. Yeah. But anyways, his podcast that he did with Brian Regan, he, Brian Regan actually like does a take on one of his bits as if he was a dirty comic. And it's so funny because he's like, Chris is like, have you ever thought about doing like an alternative room and just like doing a dirty set just for the fun of it? You know, it's never going to get aired. Like, you know, it's no one, you know, none of your audience is ever going to see it. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, just take one of my like clean sets and make it. And he's like, what is the fucking deal with these fucking pop tarts, man? And like he does the whole pop tart bit, but making it dirty. And it's so funny, man. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to show. I'll have to find the link and send it to you. It's great. Oh, dude, that would be so fucking funny. It's to great. See. But um, but yeah. So Brian Regan, love Brian Regan. I also um. I also have always loved Nick Swartzen for some reason. Yeah, you know why? I bet I know why. It's probably because the same reason why I liked him. is because he just looked like a guy you would know. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's like a normal dude. Like, just like a a suburban white dude talking about farts. Yep. But he was just really funny. And he does funny voices when I was younger. I love the voices. Oh, Nicholas. Yeah. You should fight crime. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good bit. That's so true, though. <laughs> that about, like, you mean this stool? <gasps> the, yeah. And he was like, you mean, uh, yeah, it's, it, that, that's, that's a great bit. You know what's um, a crazy story about his first album? Hmm. He, re- he recorded it, and uh, he had ran the, the album a lot. Because, I mean, when you get an hour, you have to work it out over years and years and shit. But so he, he had an hour, and he just had laugh tracks. And he would literally say his jokes and be like, okay, put a laugh there. And then he would do it again and be like, okay, put a laugh. Not to say he didn't earn the laughs, because he would record it a lot, but the budget for his album was so low. It was before he got signed with Adam Sandler's, like, Happy Madison and shit. So he recorded it with no audience, or the audience was just so small that... They were dubbed in later. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, people do shit like that. And when you when you see a comedy special, you probably see something that was being filmed over like two or three nights. Oh, for sure, and they take the best bits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's honestly it's a huge gamble because you could be the best comedian in the world, but to be like, okay, we're we're not editing this, and this one hour is what you get. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. Totally. You need a little because that of- one body of work is like you said, it's been worked out over years and years, probably, mm-hmm. and that's like your piece. Like uh, I know Jay Leno. Like, he doesn't even have a, an album. Like, he never put out a body of work. Like, Mm-mm. he only did The Tonight Show. Well, he did stand-up a lot. But then but he, he never, like, released an album. Because he apparently he still does, like, same, some of the same bits that he no. used to do back in the day. Like, oh, Jesus Christ. 
So, you guys heard about these answering machines? <laughs> yeah, but like, apparently, like, his mentality was kind of like, ah, I've got a perfectly good hour. Why would I want to waste it? Why would I want to put it out there? And if, then, if 20 minutes of that hour isn't that he looks like Frankenberry, that's a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so accurate. He doesn't. He doesn't. He, he does look, look like, like Frankenberry. It's just He's, he is a cartoon. Like Jay Leno looks like a cartoon character. There's an interview where Louis is on it, and at, just at one point, I guess Louis and him are cool enough to where he could say this. I would never fucking say it. But Louis just like looks at him and he's like, "You know, I'm looking at you, and you're a, you're a weird looking guy, man. <laughs> like you know, people don't look like you." What did Jay Leno say? He laughed and he's like, what do you mean? And, and then Louis goes, he's like, you look like a drawing of a police chief. <laughs> that was really funny. Oh my God. That's so funny. Oh, we, that's so we, funny. A dra- <laughs> listeners, we are having fun. A drawing of a police chief. That's amazing. <laughs> Ro- I'm telling you, bro. If Comedy Central Roast, if you are listening, um, let me fucking write for you. Yes. It's the most fun thing in the entire world. Yeah. I love roasting. That's awesome. I know. I listened to. Um, oh, who's the uh, crap? Who's the guy that does uh, the roast battle show? Um, Jeff Ross. Not Jeff Ross. He's a. Um, you know, I was almost on that, but I was too. Really? Young. I was too young. Really? It was before it was on TV. I almost did it at the comedy store. Yeah, I was, was going to say, because that's like an actual thing. Like, they had a show, and then it became a TV show. Yeah, so not the com- not the Comedy Central roast, but you mean roast battle. Exactly, roast battle. Yeah, so I know the guy who, um, what's his, fa- not Jeff Ross, but Brian yeah. Moses, the black dude, who like is like, let's roast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him. Really? Mm-hmm. He was one of the producers for Wild and Out. That's how I met that's him. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to... Um, a podcast where one of the writers on the roast battles, he was talking about roast and stuff, and it was really oh, fascinating. It must have been. Was it Tony Hinchcliffe? Yeah, it was Tony Hinchcliffe. He's Fuck funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a really good one. That was a really good impression. Yeah, he's funny. I like him a lot. He's funny. He's um, a writer. He's a writer like a mother. Sometimes you can totally. tell people are more performers. People are more writers. Dude. Is- yeah, he's funny, man. I actually went and saw. Um, I saw Joe Rogan actually last year, and Tony Hinchcliffe opened for him, and oh, he was cool. really funny. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. He was a really good opener. Like, it was. I, I, I didn't. I hadn't heard much of him before, but he was really, really funny. Whenever, whenever I see big comics now, that's kind of my thing that I actually look forward to more. It's Is like it opener. Yeah, because I see the people on YouTube, and it's just kind of like, who's it gonna be? And like some people, like I almost, I almost over there, Kurt Metzger. I almost got to open for him. Do you know who he is? Yeah, I've heard. I've I haven't like watched his stuff, but I know who he is. He's the best. He uh, he writes for Amy Schumer's show. He used to write for Chappelle's show. He's been doing comedy nice. like twenty years, and uh, he's notorious for being late to places. And so the the host goes up, does five minutes. The middle goes up, does another five. Feature goes up and does ten. And then now Kurt should be there. Kurt is not there, so they 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 run the feature a little longer. He does he ends up doing fifteen minutes, and then now they, there's about like six of us hanging out in the green room, just being like, "Oh, we're gonna get to meet Kurt," you know? Yeah. And then they just started throwing us up just one by one by one by one because he was just really late, just doing five minutes. How sets. were you in the green room? Just because you knew some other comics? Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. It's it's normal at this point to get to hang out back there, which is cool because I used to not be allowed to. And yeah. Now, like when I do, like, I'm like fuck yeah. You're like, I'm in. Yeah. I'm in the club. Exactly. That's cool. And um, yeah, like I smoked weed with Todd Glass one time. I don't no know way. if you know who that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't like it. Really? I mean, I liked him, but I, I don't like the thing is, is with stand up, I don't smoke weed if I'm doing a show. I really don't even smoke that much anymore. I used to all the fucking time. But when I do it now, it, I, I'm so overwhelmed with anxiety, which is not what I need. No. When I have to like, Exude. If it's not going to help you, then why would you do it? Exactly. But so I just start getting high with him, and he starts telling me about all this, like, problems he's having. And, like, I was just kind of like, like, and I talk a lot, but this guy, fucking holy shit. And, and I was just kind of like, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to help you, mister. And he's like, are they a good crowd? Don't lie. Like, don't lie to me. Are they a good crowd or are they a bad crowd? I was like, they're all right. He's like, they're all right? Like, are they, like, good all right or bad all right? I'm like... I'm like, oh, I don't know. You've been doing comedy for like 30 years. Just just, <laughs> just go up there. Yeah, that's funny. And because I just, I didn't even want to smoke. I just didn't want to like look like a pussy. Mm. So, so I did it anyway. Yeah. But now I've kind of learned to be like, no. But anyway, so we were back. I think people respect it more, honestly, if you're kind of, if you say no. Because yeah. then they're kind of like, oh, okay, cool. I'm glad you like didn't 
glad you stood up for what you wanted to do, like, or whatever. Yeah, and and then also, like, um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, so, uh, so Kurt Metzger was backstage, and um, so we were all, you know, we were all about to go up. Now it's my turn. The guy just gets done with his five minutes, and I'm like, fuck yeah. And I'm like, Kurt's about to be here. Like, I'm going to get to open for Kurt Metzger. And then uh, he just comes back and says, sorry, I'm late, everybody. My, my bad. And, then and I, you didn't get to go on? And I was like, mm. Damn it, it's Kurt Metzger. But I, but I don't know what I thought would have happened. I mean, I guess in my head, I was like, I would do my stupid little jokes, and then he would see me and be like, you want to be famous? Poof, here. <laughs> let me Bernie Sanders you into being famous. <laughs> <laughs> and then I and then I would just be good. But yeah, no, I just ended up being like, uh, like I had a whole thing like that I was going to say to him, like, uh, like, Oh man, like uh, I like that sketch that you wrote or whatever. And he came up, he's like, "What's going on, man?" I'm like, "It's good, good. Hi, it's a good, it's good." <laughs> it always is weird when you're intimidated to like meet someone or walk up to someone. Well, the thing is, is like I, Ti doesn't intimidate me now, but fucking Kurt Metzger did. That's funny. Do you think it's because he's in your world? Uh, maybe. And you can maybe appreciate what he does. Yeah, because Ti, it's almost so famous that he almost doesn't feel real. It's like, yeah, you very car like a cartoon, you know. You yeah. don't You look like a drawing of a police chief. <laughs> no, T I uh T I is a light skinned Lego person. Ah, uh, that's wow, that's actually a really good interpretation. Uh-huh. His head does look very Lego ish. It's incredibly Lego ish. And even kinda like the way that he like walks. <laughs> he this is a, this is a funny story. So I got to go to his uh birthday party and uh and it was ended up being a fucking crazy night. And then uh, the next morning, or maybe the next couple of days, he came to, when we were doing Ratchet People Meet, he came to one of our rehearsals because he would just drop by sometimes because I was in the neighborhood or mm-hmm. whatever he would say. Yeah. And he came by and we were all like, yo, man, that party was crazy, man. And like he came up and uh, he's like, hey, how's it going? And I was like, dude, thanks so much for inviting me, man. That, that party was like, it was crazy. It was like some kind of a weird dream. And then he just looks at me and he's like, well, yo ass better wake the fuck up. And I and I was just like, oof. <laughs> I, I kind of couldn't even be mad because I was like, that was a good one. <laughs> that was good. He was like, and it, I kind of was like, you better wake your ass up, motherfucker. This like, is real life. Yeah, you better wake your ass up. And get with the due diligence, or we gonna be at odds. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, we gonna be at odds. I got to see him like, I got to see him like be a parent. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, he had his kids with him. And, like, the little ones were kept getting distracted. And he's like, now, listen, when we get home, you can do the Angry Birds and the and Legos and all that. But right now, we're going to show respect to the nice people. And he, like, looked up and he's like, I'm sorry, guys. You know, five, five is a difficult age. And, like, and we're all just kind of like, yeah, we get it, man. Like, we get it, T.I. It's cool. That's awesome. But yeah, and like So where was this at his birthday, you said? Or no, this is a different no, the, thing? The, the, birthday, wild now thing. the birthday party was like a was an after party. And I've realized I've been all over the place with my tangent of things. It's but okay. um so it's kinda what we do here. Oh perfect. So uh the birthday party and was he did a free concert followed by an after party on his birthday, and that was for the cast and crew and I'm sure like people he was friends with uh from the music video that i did so because of that that's how that happened in addition to that i was with ratchet people meet still and he would just drop into our rehearsal sometimes just to see what was going on nice yeah and uh (laughs) and like but it was weird because i kind of just saw him just like he, he of any celebrity i've met he's been i mean aside from the crimes uh has been very normal and chill and and pretty down to earth and plus maybe the crimes make him more down to earth I think I think so. It's because he's like, he's like, I done so much bullshit. I don't got time for any more bullshit. Like mm. that's probably what it is. And uh, that makes sense. I just remember like seeing him like talk to one of the camera people about them having kids. He's like, Oh, you got a four year old, and they're talking like how my cousins would like talk at like a barbecue. They're like. He's well around four. You really want to start to instill the values because that's when they're really going to start to remember and like all this stuff. And I'm just like, <laughs> when they're one, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> when they're one, you can shoot your machine guns and shoot apples <laughs> off their heads. <laughs> they won't remember. Not that he would do that. No. But you know, but I may- wouldn't put it past him. 
I'm he might kidding. he might he might do it with people's babies with whom he's at odds with. <laughs> you we at odds, I'm gonna shoot apples off your baby. Given the chance I would do it since we at odds. <laughs> that guy has a way of talking. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, I had a I had a question that Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, I've just been rambling. No, it's nonsense. good, man. I, Go this has been fun. Um when when you, so earlier you're kind of talking about writing versus like performing and stuff oh yeah and like so you, when you first started out you just kind of like went up there but you you had something written right like you had written out a thing like you said you went to that open mic night and you just did it mm -hmm. like what was your preparation like and then when when did you decide like oh shit like i did good i'm gonna keep doing this kind of and like how did you prepare for all that well let me start by saying i got lucky my first time because ron white was there that night so it was like a packed out crowd no way and now i would have reveled in that i would have been like awesome they're gonna be packed this is gonna be great but I, at the time i was like no 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 like let there be as few people as possible ah. but uh because i thought i was gonna bomb and in a way i bombed because i bombed with material or i did well with material that sucked so it's kind of like hacky or whatever but if you're new, you're new, and you don't fucking know any better. Yeah. But uh, anyways, I it was so written when I first started it. Like, literally, I would be talking and be like, and then that's when I went to, like... Were he, you reading, or were you just reading from in your head? Kind from of? in my head. And, gotcha. And that's why now, when I do jokes, I when I when I write them down, I do, like, bullet points. Like, how you would do, an, like, an outline for an essay. I kind of do it like that. So you know the subject matter, but the words are coming out natural, like you would just say them. Yeah, and it's like it's like in school too. Like there, every joke to me has a thesis statement because that kind of keeps you reminded of what it is you're talking about and where you're going with it. Yeah, and so so I'll do I'll do it like that, and then um, other than that, I'll just have like little bullet points and kind of just and and just do it like that. And so after I after I did that first set and did really well, I just bombed for months and months and months because none of the other shows were as good as the improv was. Meaning the crowd wasn't as warmed up or what? Well, it, the crowd, first of all, was mostly like other much more experienced comedians. And back then, the comedy scene was a lot meaner than it is now. Now it's pretty welcoming all around. That's cool. I mean, you might have people kind of roasting and like a little maybe bit of shit talking, but... For the most part, people are pretty accepting, and it's not like how it was before. Like, it used to be, like, I would just sit in the back of the room by myself with, like, my little notebook and, like, just be waiting to go up and then bomb in front of people and then, like, having to face them on the way out and just them going up and doing good and just being like, Ah, uh, that oh. sucks. Because the, the crowd was other comedians, you're saying? Yeah. I mean, that happens a lot. Huh. Because uh, that's just like you said, the batting cage is where you just got to work your material out and see what works and what doesn't and how you can do it better. Or whatever. Yeah, and because people aren't always necessarily going to see you. And uh, and even people who are probably aren't going to fucking help you because they saw you at a batting cage. But it's just something you have to do. And if you don't, it's going to show. And you're going to look fucking stupid when it, when it comes time for you to actually do something. Hmm. Now, granted, there is also such a thing as doing it too much. You know, if you're doing if you're doing four sets a night every night of the week for like two years, you're not going to have anything to fucking talk about because you're not living a life. That's very true. And so it's it's this is just a balance that you have to find. That makes sense. And so what and like what I'll do like a little bit about like my process with jokes and stuff is right now I haven't written. I mean, I wrote the fairy tale bit, and that's probably the first new joke I wrote in like two weeks, which is rare. Usually I try to do at least a new joke per week, whether it's good or bad. Just, or not a new joke, but a new bit. A yeah. bit meaning like a couple minutes worth of on, on something. On like a subject. Yeah. and uh, But what I do is when I don't have new stuff, I go back and do my old stuff and like add and take away stuff. To where it's like still relevant. Gotcha. And you're kind of just trying to like refine that old stuff to be the best it could be, or just mm -hmm. or, gotcha. and just and just make it to where I'm excited about it. Because mm. there have been times where I where I've been on like a show that was like quote unquote like a good or like important show, and uh, and I've just been like, okay, I'm gonna do all the stuff that I know works, and I didn't do bad because it was tested material, but at the same time, I didn't do great. 
And the reason why is because I was just like running through it. Like I was like, and then I went to Catholic school and then that was like this. And like, because I'm just on autopilot pretty much. Yeah. So I always try to make sure. And you were only doing stuff that you knew would get laughs. Mm -hmm. But because maybe I hadn't done it in a couple weeks, like I could have done better if I did something brand new that I was really excited about. And maybe it had done once or twice. So I kind of knew the, the, the rhythm of it, but then could actually then go up and do it. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, there was another thing that I was going to ask. Oh yeah. When was the first time that you got like paid to do a like stand up thing? Cause I'm sure that was like a pretty big deal. It was. And I want to say it was probably my first show that I did with Ratchet People Meet. I can't say how much it was, but I can say that it was, it made my dad believe in me. <laughs> That's cool. He, and he, ne I mean, he never didn't, but I think he was always just like, oh, okay. Is like, it a dumb hobby or whatever? Exactly. But then, like, I was like, no, this is, like, for real. And, he, and I think, because you know how sometimes dads can be, is it's not that they don't care. It's just that they need for it to be tangible. Mm -hmm, like, totally. they, need, they need, like, proof. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I know about that. For sure. And so that was... What's up, dad? <laughs> yeah. What up, pops? He's not going <laughs> to listen to this. And <laughs> he doesn't care. The funny thing is, my dad might. He'd be like, yeah, have fun with your little pod racer thing that you're doing. Pod racer? I hope you, I hope you beat Sebulba. Because <laughs> he's a sneaky one. His fucking thing can shoot fire, so you better watch out. You better watch that's, out. That's for all you and, Phantom Menace fans. And, and here's a deep, deep Phantom Menace reference. Ben Quadraneros. Oh, with the four, the the green guy. The green guy that, that has no body. Did you ha did you have the game for Nintendo sixty four? The I did not. Game? But the other day, like not the other day, it was like a year ago. Me and my friend, we went and we watched all the Star Wars before oh, the yeah. new one came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And we were like Ben Quadraneros. What a character! Did so he... it's kind of like our inside joke. We always talk about Ben <laughs> Quadraneros. That's funny. My friend, one of my comedian buddies, Matt, me and him always say Stabulba. That's like, a good one. If there's a if there's a comedian that goes up that we don't necessarily like, but the crowd does. Ah, we're it's like Stabulba. Like we're like Stabulba. <laughs> that's a good that's a good reference. I like that. Oh, we're nerds. We're major nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, no done no doubt there. But it's that's like, great. But I don't know, man. Um, I I do remember getting that first check, and I remember thinking like. This is real. Yeah. And I was just like, well, I'd certainly like for this to keep coming. Yeah. And sometimes, though, what sucks about stand-up is you always have to, you, for one, you always have to be grinding. You always have to make connections because it's not, an, it's, you're not employed by anybody. Mm -hmm. So you have to build it for yourself. And then second of all, the money that you can make is good, generally speaking, but it's very inconsistent if you're going to get a good check. So you got to be smart about it. Mm. Like, don't go to the bar. Don't do what I would do all the time and don't go to the bar and be like, we'll buy and drink for everybody. Don't do that shit. Yeah, yeah. That's stupid. They'll you like, they will, if you're listening to this in the future, they'll still like you. You don't have to give them your money. You, <laughs> you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, I, I don't know, man. I just, I, it's, it's just a really cool thing to, uh, to do. I want to get something started around Kennesaw. I want to get like a show where I can bring people in from Atlanta. That's cool. What would you say like for people that are um, two things I want to talk about? Like number yeah, one, yeah, yeah. what do people what do people need to do if they like have, you know they've always thought like damn I wish you know that'd be so cool to be a stand up comic but I don't know where to start kind of thing. And then also earlier you kind of mentioned that you kind of want to move into the whole like YouTube space and doing like internet stuff like. So I kind of want to talk about that too, but like sure. those two topics I think would be kind of interesting. Okay. Well, first I'll just say the YouTube thing. I, I want to make sure that I build a following through YouTube, but stand up will always be what I want to do. Gotcha. I'll, Makes I'll, sense. I will never not be doing stand up, Even if it becomes clear that I can't get famous and I got to fucking work at a Best Buy or some shit, like and just manage a Radio Shack or whatever the fuck happens. <laughs> even, even I don't think you're going to be managing any Radio Shacks. I think they all went out of business. <laughs> Yeah, my friend used I'll to be a, a job manager of a radio shack, and he just got laid off. Oh, that sucks. I know. What's up, Chad? They're like, well, you get to keep all the little micro racers or whatever the <laughs> fuck they sell there. You get to keep all these quadcopters. <laughs> we have a Ben Quadraneros replica. You can have that. 
<laughs> to remind you of the, how much of a loser you are. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. he didn't even cross. He, he didn't, didn't even, even lose. Cross. He didn't cross the fucking finish line. Wow, that's the worst. Yeah, with quadruple the engines. Anyways, hence um, the quad. But e- yeah, even if I just like end up just like living a quote unquote like normal life, I'll still go out to open mic nights and do it just because it's just fun for me, and mm-hmm. I generally I genuinely like doing it. But. I want to do YouTube stuff just so I can build a following and it can open more doors for more uh, people I can work with and, and, and help kind of expand the network and stuff like that. Totally. And uh, I and agree I mean, 100% with that. Do you know who Judd Apatow is? Are you familiar? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of like a role model for me. For those of you who don't know, he like directed Freaks and Geeks, uh, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up. Uh, he produced Superbad as well as Pineapple Express and he did This Is 40. And most people don't even know what he looks like. I know. And he also did, he did Amy Schumer's movie that just came out, Trainwreck, and then the new one, Big Sick, with Kumail Nanjiani. And he, uh, but just the way that he works and his grind and his hustle, that's something I would really want to. Didn't he do some w- other Will Ferrell movies too? Yeah. Did he do he, Talladega Nights? Yeah. He, well, he didn't direct it, but he produced it. A, Adam, uh, I got stuck under that. Oh, whoops. Adam, uh, Adam McKay directed that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one who did, like, Step Brothers. Did he do Benchwarmers? Maybe? Don't no, know. that's Happy Madison. Gotcha. He wasn't involved in that. I don't know shit. I'm, I shouldn't know this. <laughs> this, this, this. This information doesn't matter. <laughs> but, but anyways, Judd Apatow, yes. Big, that's, you're that's, a big fan. Yeah, that's kind of what I, I would model it after. And I want to use YouTube to maybe start making skits and, and doing little, little things like that. Like We thought of one. I, maybe I shouldn't say this on the podcast. It doesn't matter. We uh, we thought of one where uh, we were gonna do it. You remember the Sham Wow commercial? Mm-hmm. How the guy was like so like Vince. Yes, yeah. So we wanted to do one where it, where it's uh, it's a it's a jizz rag, but it's called the Shame Wow because you're like ashamed of yourself yeah, after yeah, you're yeah. done masturbating. I like it. And so like, you know, people are usually like, "Wow, thanks, Sham Wow." It's like them like cutting to the people and they're like, "Don't tell my dad!" Like they're like freaking out. <laughs> the shame! Wow, I like that. It's just an example of just dumb things that we think of. Yeah. But what was your first question? Oh, people who want to start stand up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't, because you're gonna take time away from me. Uh, ah, no, yes. no, no. If you if you wanna if you wanna get into stand up comedy, watch a lot of it. That would be that would be my thing. Is just watch a lot of it first and like just, become a student of it and figure out mm-hmm. how. Yeah, and then um, go out. There's a thing. There's a thing on Google called the Atlanta Open Mic Calendar. And if you just, and also if you just want to see stand up, you can go to any of these. Um, where you, it's, a lot of them are just show up, go up. If not, you just email someone or message them on Facebook, and you get five minutes or however long you get, and just start bombing. Like just get out there and start bombing, and then learn to not care about bombing, and then that's when you can actually really start to work and get better. Is when you stop giving a shit about that. Hmm. And that's why that's why I always felt like I I think I have a real comedian grind now, but I always was a little embarrassed when I started because I mean of course I was thankful for everything that Ratchet People made, did for me, but when I was starting I was too new to be going in, in front of crowds like that, and so like it, you said a thousand people or whatever. Yeah, it wasn't always that, but there were quite a few times where it was like wow. enough for that to stick in my mind that early on. And I mean, even since, I don't think I've performed for a crowd that big. And uh, a thousand people is a lot. It is a lot. It's a, it's a lot of fucking people, and uh, and it, it instilled bad habits because like you can't just you got to pause more. And when you go to like a bar amongst your other comedians, who I mean, I think I'm pretty well respected in the comedy scene. I hope. But like back then, I, there's no fucking possible way I was. They were I was Sebulba for sure. Like just being like oh, <laughs> the crowd you. loved you, but all the other pod racers hated you. Yeah, straight up. And so uh, in this scenario, pod <laughs> racers means other comedians. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. So, uh, but people who don't know Star Wars is like, why? Who's Sebulba? Why are you even listening to the fucking podcast, bro? If you don't like Star Wars. You need to get your life right and watch. Get, get up on them prequels. They're not that bad. Just don't They're watch them bad. first. They're a little bad. Just four, five, six, one, two, three. Just do it that way, yeah. and you'll be okay. My buddy Corey said the funniest thing about those. He he goes, "I hate the prequels. I hate them so much." And I was like, "Why?" And he's like, "Well, there's only three scenes that happen in any of them, gen- genu- generally." And he goes, "Uh, it's people sitting in a circle and talking." It's people walking somewhere and talking, 
or people in their planes talking to each other. <laughs> it's just like it's just too much annoying dialogue. So true, man. Like it's just a whole movie of them just being like, "What do you think is going to happen? I have a bad feeling about this." And then it happens, and then they f- fix it obviously because they are Jedi's. There's a in the Senate, blah blah blah. <laughs> oh, the Senate. They God, <laughs> why do they have so many damn scenes of the Senate? <laughs> Who cares? I never understood it when I was a kid. Me neither. I was like, this is so boring. And then I'd be like, like show me more lightsabers. Like, and, that's what I want to see. And now that I do understand it, I watch it and I'm just kind of like, I was like, oh, yeah, th- this is how politics Space work. politics. <laughs> kind of like the real ones. Hmm. Yep, exactly. And then... Uh, you clever devil. George Lucas. Hmm. I wonder who their Bernie Sanders would be. I think the emperor would be their their Donald Trump. Sorry, guys. I think uh, make the galaxy great again. Well, obviously Jar Jar would be there, Bernie. Oh kidding. no! Come on. I'm just kidding. Give, I, give, I just wanted to Jar say Jar. The most Jar Jar would be. Who would he be? I don't even know. It doesn't matter. He was a dumb character. You know, the, this is we're getting into some nerd stuff real quick. But there's a uh, there's a theory that Jar it's Jar Jar's fault that like the emperor happened. Have you heard that theory? <laughs> I heard something like that. Because he gave the power. It doesn't matter. We can talk about this later. But the, <laughs> anyways, comedy is a beautiful thing. Indeed. And it it uh, it should be respected as as one of the last true art forms. I think as corny and, uh-huh. and as corny and as goddamn pretentious as that sounds, I think it's true. Because it's really cool because people can speak their minds. They can say what they want to say. Not in Canada, though. What happened in Canada? Did you hear about that? Like, there's this one comedian that uh, offended some lesbians in the crowd, and he actually got uh, jail time or something. Jesus and Christ. And it's like, dude, you do realize that they paid the money. Mm-hmm. He roasted them, and then they sued him, and they won. And, like, he's, like, having to... Do you know what he said? I mean, and I guess not that that really matters, but... No, but, yeah, he, he said something. He called him dykes or something. Like, he said something. Well, he some should, kind of... That's one of those things where he shouldn't he shouldn't have done that. Even if he... Like, he should have known that there would have been consequences to that. Yeah, I don't think he should have gotten fucking jail but time. The thing no, that's is, insane. Is, yeah, the thing is, though, it's, like, they were heckling. It wasn't, like, out of the blue. Oh, yeah. He just called them dykes or something. Like, and I'm probably getting the story wrong, so... I'll, I've heard I'll it. link... I've, yeah. I'll link something about it in the show notes because uh, yeah. it's interesting. But yeah, it's, it, Canada does, doesn't really have free speech, which is weird. Yeah, and that sucks. And I, it's one of those things where, like, as a comic and just also understanding how audiences work, like, I always try to play devil's advocate in those situations. Like for, for sure. And and that's why like people tell me all the time they're like, "Don't be such a pussy, man. Like, don't be so worried about like offending everybody." And I'm like. It's not like life isn't Reddit. Like you don't get to like be behind your computer and just say whatever the fuck you want to say. True like that. you you can't do that. Like it's you, easy to say when you're not the one on stage and your face isn't the one that's being ex- related to it. And exactly. And it's also like they say it like I have all these secret evil things that I want to say but can't. And that's not true at all. Like I don't I don't sit at home like man if only I could just say this thing about Puerto Ricans. Like <laughs> I don't have any fucking problem with anybody. <laughs> If there's something I think is funny, I'm going to say it. But, like, the way that some some people will tell me things is they're like, you know, you're, you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't be so worried about offending people. And it's like, well, it sounds to me like you're saying I should be trying to offend people on purpose. And, like, I don't want to do that either. Yeah. Like, I just want to be funny. It just period, point, plain and simple. It's just, I just want to be funny. And because also, like... I get, I get it. Like, of course, you should push the envelope and stuff. Richard Pryor did that. George Carlin did that. Dave Chappelle did that. Louis does that. Everybody fucking does that shit. Yeah. But you got to. But also, you need to understand, especially like I'm a nobody, right? I might have a couple people who might see me at a show and be like, "Oh, he's here. I like him." Like, there might that would probably be the extent of of my success at the moment. And it probably shouldn't be anything more than that because I'm only three years in and who knows? A lot of power and success could really fuck my career up, possibly. And um, But the thing is, is like you have real people coming out who live real lives and, and they're coming out to enjoy you and like there's no reason to be just to fuck them. Don't like, to, I wouldn't fuck somebody's night up on purpose. Mm, I feel you. Unless, I feel you. Unless somebody like heckled me really bad and I was just over it. 
Because mm. it, it happens. Then they kind of deserve it. Yeah, and it happens sometimes <laughs> because I'm like, you know, I just think I'm like, sometimes I'll get heckled and I'll be like, good, I, I kind of didn't want to do my material anyways. Thank you. And <laughs> then, then you were giving me something else to do. Yeah, and I'm just like, you know what, man? You Is something wrong at home? <laughs> What is happening that's making you be like this to people? Yeah. I'm I'm fine. I'm going to be mad because you ruined my night a little. But if I can get a bigger laugh than you got from people, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. But sometimes Heck, I... When I, will hecklers learn? Never. There's always going to be people who do that. I've met people who tell me they're like, oh, you're a comedian, huh? Well, uh, you know what I really like to do? We like to go to the shows and uh, heckle you guys, really put you on your toes. And I'm like... I know I've said it before, but it's like, I get that you think that you're helping, but that's the worst thing you could ever do. Yeah, like, I think some people think they're literally contributing something. Like, oh, this guy, he's got to go up for 30, he probably only has 20 minutes, so I got to give him a little help here. <laughs> yeah, let me help him out, this fucking guy who's made a career from his own thoughts. Yeah. And let me just, let me just chime mine in, because I fucking, I drive a truck, so let me, let me just say what I'm thinking. I've only seen a few times where heckling actually adds something. There's some, like, I've, I've seen it, like, once or twice where, like, someone will say something, and you're like, that was funny. I'm going to keep doing my thing, but that, you know, or whatever. Oh, I would never do that, because that would be to let them win. Yeah, yeah, I feel you, I feel you. Sometimes what can help, too, and what, what crowds really like, is if, uh, oh, and another thing, too, is if I'm doing, like, crowd work is totally different. I like doing that. I've actually been doing a lot more of that lately. Where you're just like, where are you from? What do you do? Just basic shit like that. And um, sometimes I try to ask more polarizing questions. Like I'll be like, who's your least favorite cousin and why? <laughs> that's that's good. And just, normally they're like, John, what do you do, John? Yeah, exactly. Uh, accountant, huh? Is that, <laughs> is that your wife next to you, John? How long you guys been? Two years. Oh, my God. Don't need a calculator to add up those years. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> accountant jokes. Watch out. <laughs> So he knows it. Yeah. I'm already, I'm so in comedy mode that even though we're just talking, I'm like, no, I have to have something for this or I lose. <laughs> it's, it's like oh, that. Oh, that's a good, huh. That's it, funny. And sometimes too, if you're talking to comedians and shit, I try to not do this. I mean, I will when I'm with other comics because we know how it is, but like, we'll be like talking, like at just at dinner or like my cousins will say something really funny and I'll just be like, that's really good. And they'll be like, What? And, like, I'm thinking of it as, like, yeah, that's, like, a good angle. Like, that could work. And they're, like, what do you mean? I was just making a joke. And I'm, like, oh, yeah, I forgot this doesn't consume everybody's life, thinking about this all the time. <laughs> like, you're saying it to them, like, that was really good. Or you're thinking it to yourself. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I'll say it out loud. There, and there's been times where, like, I've been, on, I've been on dates, and, like, I'm trying to be, like, more charming. And not just a boring... Like, ha I'm the funny guy. No, well, no. I don't talk like that. I know, but... I know. But, like, that's how... Like, oh, going on a date with a comedian, oh. Mm. Nah, I would hope not. I would I know, hope right? that that's not what it was. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I would, I would catch myself. Like, I would say something very quick, and I'd be like, oh, I really want to write it down. But if I write it down, I'm going to... This is going to fuck things up. Because, like, a girl's like, oh, how did the date go? And she'd be like, well... Anytime I would laugh, he would go on his phone and he would write some shit down. I'm pretty sure he was writing down what <laughs> what he said to me. I just I give him the the finger, not like the middle finger, but like the Dude, pointer finger. Dude, I got finger. your solution. Just uh, yeah. Just voice to text and exactly do it again. just or or just record your entire date. No, that's that that is what got uh, Nixon impeached. I'm pretty sure. Ah, uh, you're right. Is that kind of that kind of scandalous behavior? You are correct. That's true. I, would, I just got back from Washington, D.C. I learned that. Was, you just did? Literally last night I flew in from Washington, D.C. Yeah, man. That and shit... I, I went and I learned about how Nixon did that. No, I'm just kidding. I, I didn't learn anything about Nixon. Could you imagine being kicked out of being the president? That shit's got to be embarrassing. Didn't he kind of... Well, he was like going to be... He resigned, but yeah. he was going to be kicked out. And then he yeah, got... Yeah, because on... like Clinton got impeached, but like he still finished it out. Yeah, I don't understand how any. I don't. Yeah, I understand like, so so little. Yeah, me too. That, that was the that was the funniest thing about being in Washington D.C. I'm just like, I don't get any of this. Like, <laughs> how do we went and like looked at the Senate gallery and like watched them like talk and argue their point, and I was just like, what the? 
what is happening? Yeah, Jar Jar, where's had, Jar Jar? This is, yeah. doesn't make sense to me. Where's the Emperor? I thought this was the Senate. <laughs> I thought I was going to see some floating chairs. <laughs> well, they, those were badass. <laughs> those were sweet. But, <laughs> yeah, that, I, don't, I don't get all that. I just, yeah. But that, Washington, D.C. is a whole other weird land. But it was fun. I liked Washington, D.C. It's cool. Oh, hell yeah. I, I remember I went there and like a sixth grade field trip or something. And my buddy, my buddy Alex, I'm actually going to get drinks with him after this. He, uh, I've known him since we were probably like five. And he was always like a junior little whiz kid. Like he had, he had stocks invested uh, when he was like maybe seven years old. And uh, I, was, I would always call him a nerd, but now he's got so much money. And I remember he made fun of me because we went to the Bureau of Printing and Engraving and uh, one of the souvenirs that they sold was like money that was still like stuck together. And so I bought money with money, like with more money. Like I paid like $7 for like $4 being stuck together. And he's just like, you've got to be the stupidest person in the world. I was like, but but it's what they but do. But it's connected. Yeah, exactly. And it's I, like when it's like misprints of Pokemon cards, dude. It's more rare. Uh, and then just fucking exactly. And then and then I think maybe when I was like fourteen or fifteen, I might have like wanted cigarettes and might have just been like cut it out and got some. <laughs> That's hilarious. Fuck you, childhood. I'm gonna get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It went back to to zero. Does that do that when it hits a certain amount of time? It does, indeed. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, It's good. pretty funny. No, but actually, I was going to say, I feel like this is a good, like, wrapping up point. I feel like totally. we talked about everything. But... Yeah. Yeah, it, it's cool because uh, once it, like, hits the limit, it's like, ah, oh, this file's too big. We're going to start a new one. But it freaks people out. And I was just like, haha, yes, it did go back to zero. We're gonna have to do this podcast all over again. Oh man, That's how I'm I not gonna remember. Em. I'm not gonna remember any of those things I was saying. That's before. how I trick them. That's how you get them. That's how I get them. I just I don't have any friends, and I just want to hang out with people <laughs> twice. <laughs> you son of a bitch! I, I knew. tricked you. I lured you in specifically. I. Mm. <laughs> you're the only one who's ever listened to this podcast, Will. Oh and, man. And uh, and now we're here. And you wasted the last two hours. No. Get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what was I going to say? Uh, I lost my train of thought. But um, good place to wrap it up. How can people find you? Where can they watch your stuff? Where can they go see you live? Okay. Anything else you want to promote? Yeah, totally. Um, all right. So you can follow me. I have a Twitter. I'm trying to use it more. It's at WT Foskey, F-O-S-K-E-Y. Also, my Instagram is at W T F O S K E Y because it gets because it's like what the fuck, but it's my name. Uh, and, like uh, what the frasky? <laughs> yeah. it, I don't know why everyone for you is the penguin, but <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I always like doing that voice. Uh, and give it up for Mister uh, Host from the forties. Um, <laughs> and so, and then if you want to come see me live, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to do a lot better of of posting updates on stuff like that on uh, Instagram. And um, just check like the little story thing or whatever, and I'll let everybody know where I'll be at. Um, most Mondays, there's a good chance you could see me at Star Bar and uh, and Little Five Points. Also, the 1 a.m. Secret Show at Smith's Old Bar on Saturday nights at 1 a.m. So technically Sunday. And uh, you know, if if I'm anywhere besides those two places, I'll I'll post it. And um, thank you for having me on the, on the show, man. This is dude. Been great. It was really fun. Yeah, this is a super fun podcast. I definitely want to get like more comedians on the show because I love I love comedy. I love laughing. So this was a really fun podcast, dude. This is great. But um, dude, that's it. So uh, peace out, everybody. Bye, guys. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. That was a super 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 fun podcast. Um, even re-listening to that episode, I was cracking up the whole time. That was really great. Um, make sure you follow Will on Instagram at WT Fosky so you know where he will be performing next. Go out and see him. Um, I'm going to probably go out to one of his shows soon because I would love to go uh, see him live and see what he does in person. But that's all I got. Episode 22 is up next with my friend Alex Guthrie. Alex is an amazingly talented musician and photographer. You might recognize him 
from the nationally aired ad campaign he recently did with Jennifer Hudson. What? And that was with American Family Insurance. I keep seeing him everywhere on billboards, seeing him on TV, hearing his commercial on the radio, and every time I see it, I like freak out because I can't even believe I know this dude. But I met Alex about five years ago through some mutual friends around the time when he was first auditioning for American Idol. And he basically just like dropped out of college to go compete in the third round before getting turned down by one judge, one silly judge who convinced one of the other judges to give him a no as well. And um, that kind of stunk. But you know what? Needless to say, Alex didn't stop and the future is super bright. Um, His album Lessons Learned is available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever else you want to find it. It's there, and he has new music coming very soon. And in this episode, we talked about um, how he got into music, his experience with American Idol, dealing with depression, going on tour, how he got the commercial with Jennifer Hudson, getting together his band and how they record, and much more. And this is one of my favorite episodes so far. Don't forget to go listen to Alex's music. You will not regret it. I'm going to be releasing that episode tomorrow, so keep it locked right here. If you want to support the podcast, the best way to do that is to go to iTunes or the podcast app if you have an iPhone and find the Andrew Deitch podcast. Leave it a five-star review. Please, please, please. There's like 2,600 people that have listened to this podcast and haven't left a review. So if half of you would go leave a review, that would literally blow my numbers out of the water. If 5% of you would go review... It would blow my numbers out of the water. So please go to iTunes and rate the podcast five stars. I'm not asking much. It takes like two minutes. I'm talking to you. It will really, really help me. And I'm trying to jump into that featured section in iTunes. That is what's going to get me in there. So please, 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 please do that. And download all the episodes. That is and downloading all the episodes really, really helps. So do that. If you want to follow me on social media, the best way to find me is to go to my website, andrewdeitch.com. That's andrew, D-E-I-T-S-C-H.com. And you can find links to all my social media stuff. Go follow me on Instagram at ADpodcast. I post a lot of cool stuff there. That's all I got. Keep it locked. More podcasts coming soon. I'll see you soon, everybody.